Good morning. This is a meeting of the Coconino County Board of Supervisors. Today is uh, September 1st, Tuesday, and we have our a regular board meeting. I'd like to call us to order. And would you please stand um, and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And um, today we have uh, three supervisors that are present at the meeting. Um, I am Liz Archuleta, the chair of the board of supervisors. We also have uh, our vice chair, Lena Fowler from district five and Supervisor Parks from District 4. Uh, both Supervisor Babbitt and Supervisor Ryan are out on uh, previously scheduled commitments. So just to, I just wanna make sure that Supervisor Fowler and Supervisor Parks um, are on. So if you would just uh, acknowledge that you are present. Supervisor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. This is Supervisor Lena Fowler. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Supervisor Parks. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, present. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we now go to the call to the public. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak to the Board of Supervisors about an item that is not on our agenda. Please know we will not be, be, we will not be able to engage in a discussion, but we'd be happy to hear you. You have about five minutes to speak to us. Is there any member of the public who wishes to do so? And the way you would let us know is by um, using the function on Zoom to raise your hand or to write in the chat that you would like to speak during call to the public. And let me check to see if there is anybody. That has indicated. I do not see anyone. Let me just ask. Um, our public affairs director who's assisting with the meeting if he sees anybody who also has indicated their wish to speak. Madam Chair, we do not have anyone at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, and so we will then go on to our next item. Today we have the um, honor of putting forth um, a few proclamations. The first one is consideration and possible action to approve a proclamation designating September 2020 as Hunger Action Month. This is out of our Health and Human Services Department and our HHS Division Manager, Michelle Axlin will introduce the proclamation. Michelle? Thank you, Madam Chair and Board of Supervisors. Um, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to acknowledge the dedication and hard work of our community partners as they help feed our community. We're so fortunate to have them with us today that we would like to acknowledge Mary Stevens from the Circle of Page, Mike Scott from the Grand Canyon Food Pantry, Sierra Church, I sorry, Sierra from the St. Mary's Food Bank and Carrie from the Flagstaff Family Food Center, Richard Bush from the Cameron Assembly of God and David from the Ash Fork Foursquare Church and the Havasupai Tribe said their thank yous for acknowledging the work that they are doing, but could not make it this morning. We are so fortunate to have these partners who continue to address the urgent need of assistance in feeding our community members and with the approval from the board, I would like to proceed with Carrie and Sierra reading the proclamation for us. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome. Madam Chair, just briefly before they begin. Uh, yes. We do have many proclamations. If there are folks who are attendees that we don't have moved up to panelists, as we get to you, just raise your hand. We'll do that if we don't have your name down and have you moved over to speak yet. Sorry. Thank you for that, Eric. Okay, so welcome Carrie and Sierra. Thank you for um, having us. Um, so our proclamation designating September 2020 as Hunger Action Month, whereas Hunger Action Month is a nationwide month-long hunger awareness campaign intended to raise food, funds, and awareness about hunger in communities across the United States. And as where in Arizona, over 1 million people suffer from food insecurity, 
And whereas lack of consistent access to food is a problem for one in eight individuals, one in five are children and one in seven are seniors in Arizona. And whereas the need for hunger relief services is even higher in Coconino County, with 21% of the population considered food insecure and over half the children in Flagstaff qualifying for free or reduced price lunch. And whereas the Flagstaff Family Food Center provides extensive and wide reaching emergency food support for the Flagstaff community, serving approximately 2,000 people per day with an approximate poundage of 30,730 pounds per day in Northern Arizona. The St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance provides 24,500 pounds per day equaling 20,000 meals a day distributed in Coconino County. And whereas the Coconino County Board of Supervisors encourages all community members to work to support the efforts of organizations that provide hunger relief services and long-term solutions to poverty to our most vulnerable neighbors. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Supervisors of Coconino County, Arizona, do hereby proclaim September 2020 as Hunger Action Month in Coconino County, Arizona, and call upon the citizens of Coconino County to join community agencies in a partnership of understanding and compassion to make our community a healthier, safer, more connected community where families have the resources and opportunities to improve their well being. Well, thank you very much. Let me see if there's a motion to uh, approve the proclamation and designate September 2020 as Hunger Action Month. Board members, is there a motion to do so? And you might need to unmute. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Madam Chair. Excellent. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to uh, approve a proclamation designating September 2020 as Hunger Action Month. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, passes unanimously. And we would like to thank all of um, all of our food banks throughout the county. Uh, we want to thank um, the pantries, uh, St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance, uh, the Grand Canyon Food Pantry, Page Food Bank, Flagstaff Family Food Center. I mean, all of the the many wonderful volunteers that that work at the food banks and the food pantries, um, what you do on a daily basis makes the difference in the lives of many. And so we thank you so very much. Did we have anybody else, um, Ms. Axelin, who had planned to speak? We did not, Madam Chair, thank you for asking. Okay, great, well, thank you. And if there are any activities or any way that we can promote that September 2020, um, you know, is um, Hunger um, Action Month and, and really create the awareness of hunger and the need to be able to contribute to our food banks, please let us know. We'd be happy to get that out on our social media and out to our listservs. And thank you to Sierra and to Carrie for reading the proclamation. It's very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. We're now gonna go to thank item you. number two, consideration. Oh, yes, go ahead, Supervisor Fowler. I'm sorry, but I, I just want to thank everyone for your work in this area. Um, during this pandemic, it's still, a, it was very scary time. Um, this virus hit without any notice and people were caught off guard. Um, and it is still, we're still in that process and I know that you all have helped so many community members that have uh, really um, been impact. We've had, we have such unprecedented unemployment in our communities and people in such need. And so you came through and helped our community members um, from a single household to family households, drove trucks out and we really had to, and really involved the community as well to asking for the, um, the volunteers to come out and 
a lot of community education, I think, has been accomplished through this process. I just want to thank each and every one of you for really caring and making sure that people were fed. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I know that if all the individuals that you help, if they were all here, they would be um, thanking you as well. So I just want to um, thank you. Thank you so much. You're on mute, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, you're muted. I said, thank you so much, Supervisor Feller. We really can't do it without them. It takes an entire community to, to respond and help one another. And that's the beauty of Coconino County and all of our partners. Supervisor Parks, did you want to add anything? I did. I wanted to thank these folks from, from my constituency and from my heart for um, what you did, what you all accomplished uh, during the COVID-19 virus pandemic. It was, it was fantastic. I was out on Navajo Nation many times when the St. Mary's food trucks would come through and, and the, other, the other organizations. We are, ourselves, we had organization that we, uh, we were taking food out as well and, and it all paid off. We have, we have uh, really done a good job between those of us and those of you that, that have contributed out, out there and in the rest of our communities. Williams and Flagstaff and Page and all the rest. So thank you very much for everything you've done. We appreciate it very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we'll now go on to item number two. This is consideration and possible action to approve a proclamation designating September 2020 as National Suicide Prevention Month. And we have our Stronger as One program manager, Erica Shaw, who will introduce and read the proclamation. And also I understand members of the Executive Leadership Council and Stronger as One full coalition were invited to attend. And um, some of you may be present. So if you had planned to speak, please let us know and we will um, make sure that your uh, mute button is off and that you're able to speak. Ms. Shaw. Thank you so much, Chairman Archuleta, Board of Supervisors. I wanna take a moment to thank all of our partners throughout the county um, and throughout our region, the Board of Supervisors, County Manager Jane, and all of our coalition members who continue to put mental health and well-being at the forefront of what we do and who we are as a community and as a region. Um, I'd like to share that we are hosting multiple suicide prevention um, activities and events this month in partnership with NACA. And I would encourage, those are all open to the public, I'd encourage all of you to visit our Stronger as One website and our social media accounts for more information. The NARB Institute is also hosting a Grand Rounds presentation this month, which will be open to the public. And the featured speaker will be Thomas Joyner, who is a nationally recognized expert in suicide and suicide prevention. And again, that will be open to the public. So you can visit our website for more information. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our Executive Leadership Council members who are here with us today, City Councilwoman Jamie Whelan, Carrie Bloom representing the NARB Institute, Dr. John Perez from the NARB Institute, City Council, uh, City, my apologies, County Manager Jimmy Jane, um, as well as Dr. Colleen Smith from Coconino Community College and many others, as well as our coalition members. So with that, I will introduce our proclamation designating September 2020 as National Suicide Prevention Month. Whereas our country observes National Suicide Prevention Month in September to prevent further loss from death by suicide, acknowledge the lived experience of attempt survivors, and recognize and honor lost survivors' experiences. And whereas Coconino County remains committed to participating in Stronger as One, serving Northern Arizona, and working to build a culture of knowledge, compassion, and action for mental health and well being to improve the lives of community members and prevent further losses. Whereas in the United States, one person dies by suicide every 11 minutes. And in 2019, the national rate of death by suicide was 14.21 per 100,000 people. In Arizona, this same rate was 19 per 100,000. And tragically in Coconino County, the rate of death by suicide was 29.2 per 100,000 people 
representing a traumatic loss of life and widespread impact in our county. Whereas each person's death by suicide exposes at least 135 other people to the trauma of loss with over 6.9 million newly bereaved individuals each year. Whereas death by suicide affects individuals, families, and the entire Coconino County community, particularly during this tremendous time of upheaval and uncertainty, where individuals may struggle with physical distancing and isolation as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas many in, of the individuals impacted by this crisis, including lost survivors, never receive supportive services as a result of significant prejudices and discrimination. Whereas death by suicide can be prevented and individuals experiencing mental health challenges can and often do find supports which enable them to live a long, healthy life in our communities. And whereas sharing personal experiences of living with mental illness or the loss of a loved one to death by suicide can reduce barriers and normalize the process of individuals seeking mental health treatment. And now, therefore, we do hereby proclaim September 2020 as Suicide Prevention Month, pledging to continue supporting suicide prevention efforts across the county in partnership with Stronger as One and our other community partners. Thank you, Erica. And was there anybody else from the Stronger as One Coalition or from the um, Executive Leadership Council that uh, planned to speak this morning? I don't believe so. <laughs> if okay. I'm forgetting one of you in the ELC, please let me know. I apologize. Okay, or you're welcome if they're, you're welcome to if you would like to. All right, well, why don't we um, approve the proclamation first and then you can tell us a little bit about maybe some of the activities that are planned for the month. So is there a motion to approve the proclamation designating September 2020 as National Suicide Prevention Month? I will make that motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Madam Chair. Okay. Great, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, passes unanimously. So Erica, do you wanna tell us a little bit about some of the activities that are planned? Yes, absolutely, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So um, we will be working with NACA and the Native Connections Program to host a free shoe stories event in partnership with um, an artist who will be leading young people in painting their stories on their shoes. Um, we will be releasing three, the first 30 young people who register for the event will get free white sneakers to paint their stories on. And we're opening it up to the public um, that anyone with those shoes and who wants to participate can, that'll be at the end of the month. We're also going to be having a geocaching for mental health event that will again be open to the public that's going to be running the 21st of September through the 27th where we'll have um, mental health geocaches located throughout um, Flagstaff so that young people can go and find find prizes and walk around the community while maintaining physical distancing but participating in, in a fun event. Um, so those are our two primary ones and then again the NARBA Institute will be hosting their grand rounds with um, Thomas Joyner as their speaker, and that will be later on in September. And all of that information can be found on our website and our social media accounts. Great, well, that sounds really exciting. And we would also like to get it out um, on our social media and to our listeners. Of, um, really, it's, um, it's something that everyone can participate in and we certainly want to get um, the, uh, the speaker on our calendar. Um, that's that's amazing. So thank you to you and to the entire coalition and to the Executive Leadership Council for the work that you're doing. I mean, you all have been hitting the ground running and haven't stopped since. And so, uh, and even through the pandemic, you're thinking of creative and innovative ways to, um, to get the word out and to um, support um, our community and to make sure that all of us um, 
make sure that September is a time of awareness and a time of coming together to address um, a very important need in our community. Um, mental health and, and death by suicide is something that um, all of us in the community can certainly, um, certainly have has touched us in one way or another and something that we want to make sure that the entire county is a part of. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much, Supervisor Coletta. Any other board members who wish to speak? Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Vice Chair Fowler. It's really great to see you all. Hi, and seen you all for in a while. Um, this is a really painful feel. Um, this is such a, um, it takes big hearts to be able to address this um, issue that people struggle with. Um, and these are very um, hard times, difficult times for people that are challenged with um, mental health issues. Um, already there's a lot of stress, not even when you don't believe you have mental health issues. I think at one point or another, you know, we, we ourselves, um, so-called normal people, you know, they, we also get um, depressed or get upset or get really stressed about different issues. I think we all are and you're all helping us. And I just want to thank each of you because I think this is a very difficult, you have to be strong yourself to be able to address others, um, try to help others, especially with this kind of issue where it's just, um, you know, you have, sometimes you wonder why the people that need help the most just don't seek that help or accept the help. Maybe it's because they don't realize it. And how do you get that education out? How do you, how do you convince someone to get help? And that's what you're all trying to do and being creative and coming up with events and coming up with um, you know, various ways of reaching people. I just wanna thank all of you and all the others that are not with us that are working in this field. Um, you know, this pandemic has really, I think, uh, caused great challenge mentally um, and in individuals and within families. So I just wanna thank you for your work and bringing this to the board. And I'm just really um, thankful for you everything that you're doing. Thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Parks, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, I too feel the same way. We have um, this, the suicide is such a destructive, not only to the person who is involved in the suicide, but their entire family and their friends and their entire circle of, of the people that they care about is extremely, uh, negatively impacted by by suicide and and sometimes it it, it makes suicide become uh, catching uh, these things are are very very important what you all are doing is very important in in the role that you have taken on and um, I commend you for that for taking it on I commend you for the work that you do and uh, we're all very grateful to you for what you do and and um, you know People who experience suicidal tendencies and who fail at that task, men, most of the time they go on and live perfectly normal lives after that. And, and so a lot of that can be attributed to people like you who are on the front lines doing the, the hard work to keep that from happening. So I commend you and thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Supervisor Parks. Thank you, Vice Chair Fowler. And again, thanks to the coalition and the Executive Leadership Council. We look forward to participating with you in the events that you have planned. Now we're gonna go on to uh, item number three, 
This is consideration and possible action to approve a proclamation designating September 15th through October 15th, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month. And Erica Philpott will introduce the proclamation. And I also um, know that we have with us present um, Public Works Engagement and Communications Manager, Viviana Reyes and um, uh, let's see, Kylani Martinez from the Flagstaff Justice Court will share in reading the proclamation. So Erica. Good morning, Madam Chair and Supervisors. I'm honored to be here today to bring forward this proclamation for your consideration on behalf of Human Resources, the County Diversity Committee, and our three advisory councils. Uh, we're pleased to bring this forward to you. And as you mentioned, Chair Archuleta of uh, Viviana Reyes and Kaylene Martinez are ready to uh, read the proclamation. And then um, if it's okay with the board afterward, we will mention a couple of events. Great, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, thank you so much for the opportunity to read the proclamation designating September 15th through October 15th, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month. Whereas Coconino County observes National Hispanic Heritage Month, recognizing the rich and diverse history and experiences of Hispanics who have helped shape North America over the last 500 plus years and have become contributors and influencers of the history the culture and achievements of the United States. And whereas Coconino County embraces Hispanic and Latino traditions, which enhance and shape our national character, promote cultural pride and is part of Coconino County's identity. And whereas in 1968, the United States Congress, Congress excuse me, passed a resolution to celebrate Hispanic heritage at the national level, and in 1988, the President of the United States formalized an annual month of Hispanic heritage recognition from September 15th to October 15th of each year. And then we're gonna to go to Ms. Martinez, right? Yes, thank you. I believe she may, may be on mute, Chair Archuleta. Okay, sure, well, well, we'll help her out with that. Mr. Peterson, can you make sure that she's moved to a speaker? Yes, ma'am, we are looking at it. Okay, sure, don't stress, we're, we're good. Eric, you may, this is Carrie Bloom. You may have accidentally unmuted me instead. I, I did, so, but Kelly, uh, Kylie Nay is, is unmuted as well and prepared to go. Okay, Kylie Nay, well, welcome. And you're gonna, you're gonna read the second half of the proclamation. Can you hear us? Madam Chair, she had messaged me that her camera wasn't working. I don't know if her microphone may not be working as well. She is present and unmuted, uh, but we may just want to continue with the reading of the second half. So. Okay, well, that's unfortunate, Kylie Nay, but we thank you so much for being willing to do that. And if you uh, like to make some comments after the proclamation, if you get your technology working, we'd welcome that. So um, Viviana, would it be okay if you go ahead and just finish it out? Absolutely. Whereas Coconino County takes great pride in highlighting the accomplishments of young and established Hispanic and Latino role models through connections in the community, classroom and workforce who are fundamental to the establishment of Flagstaff in Coconino County and its continued community growth, development and vitality. Whereas Coconino County honors the Hispanic and Latinos of our nation, state and community, including those who served in the United States Armed Forces to protect our freedoms 
And whereas Coconino County and the Board of Supervisors recognize cultural diversity as a core value of our organization with a focus on equity, social justice, and actions that move our communities forward. Now, therefore, we do hereby designate September 15 through October 15, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month and invite all residents of Coconino County to celebrate and honor Hispanic heritage and culture, embracing and echoing equity through all levels of diversity and strengthening us as a county, state, and nation forever. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and, um, and uh, take a motion to approve this proclamation designating September 15th through October 15th, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month. Is there a motion to do so? Madam Chair, I'd like to make yes. the motion. Thank you. Is there a second? And I will second the motion. All right, thank you. The, the, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, passes unanimously. And I understand we might have some members of CHOC, our Coconino Hispanic Advisory Council, as well as perhaps uh, members from the uh, Hispanic Arts and Cultural Group, Nuestros Raices, who uh, may be present. And then there were also um, some people that were invited from NAU Ethnic Studies, um, Northern Arizona University, out of the Office of Inclusion and perhaps some folks from Student Support Services. And so um, is, there, is there anybody from Chalk who uh, wishes to make some remarks? Okay, well, I will turn it over to Erica to let us know about some of the activities that are planned for the month. Erica? Great, thank you so much, Chair Archuleta. We have many great activities planned and I'll just name a few in the interest of time, but we are partnering closely with NAU this year and of course with Chalk, who is always such a great supporter of this annual event and uh, very thankful to Chair Eaton for all of her support. And she always does a wonderful lunch and learn. On September 15th at two o'clock, we'll be having Dr. Camilla Moreno from um, NAU, and she'll be talking about the challenges of COVID-19 amongst Hispanic communities. Uh, we'll also have Dr. Mark Montoya uh, from NAU on September 24th um, at 6 p.m., which is um, a partnership with the NAU. Um, it, that presentation is called Unlearning Racism, um, which will be a fantastic presentation as well. Chalk will present um, their brown bag event, a lunch and learn, a virtual lunch and learn. Um, and so that will be a great conversation. Um, also, Erica Shaw and Felice Baca will be presenting along with Chris Pastors and Amanda Atchison. So some internal county pre presenters as well. Also in collaboration with NAU on October 15th at 6 p.m., we'll have the topic of the Diary of a Dreamer, which is a virtual celebration of undocumented art, poetry, music, and talent. I'm so excited about that. And this year we're doing a call for recipes and we'll be creating a, a recipe book. Um, and that will be a really exciting way for people to share across our entire organization, um, try the recipes that are so important um, to our colleagues and team members and meaningful within their families. Um, and that connection of family and our culture um, of the county is so important. So really excited about that. And there'll be lots of great resources and links on SharePoint. We'll be posting more things um, in the county manager's update and in the connect and in our other media, as well as our SharePoint site. So excited to bring all of those forward. And, and thanks to the chair of the diversity committee, Carol Kidd for all of her work as well. Great, Adam well, thank Sarah. you. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, my oh, right, right when you asked for comments, my, my screen went blank. <laughs> Oh, that's, and that's, I had to uh, get back on. I'm, I apologize. Oh, no, I'm so glad that you're <laughs> here. So this is uh, Ruth Eden. She is the 
chair of the Coconino County Hispanic Advisory Council. And so go ahead, Ruth, so glad that you could reconnect. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. And I wanted to say that I'm very grateful that the county is practicing the diversity that they have proclaimed um, during the COVID a lot of material has gone out published in the Spanish language and there's community outreach. So I really thank you for practicing everything that is coming out of HR with diversity. Erica is doing a great job and we thank Erica and all her staff because every year they work so hard, not only for the Hispanic council, but for the other councils, they do amazing activities um, just to celebrate all the diversity we have in the county. So I want to thank all of you. And, you know, especially um, I know during this pandemic, um, we have to unite and we have to help each other. And we're seeing that with the county as far as trying to do community outreach to the different diverse communities. So we're very grateful uh, for all the staff at Coconino County. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Eden, and thank you for the work that the Coconino Hispanic Advisory Council does on a daily basis. I mean, you are definitely ambassadors for the county and you help us make that bridge uh, between community member needs and what the county services um, are, as well as impacting policy and making sure that important voices are heard and um, Latino voices are heard and that we have uh, people of color having their voices heard um, in their local government. And so we're really grateful for what you are bringing to the table on a daily basis through your service on the, on the Coconino County Hispanic Advisory Council. Thank you. Fair woman Archuleta. So, please, yes, please. go ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I too was slow on uh, unmuting myself and turning on my camera. My apologies. I'm, I'm Mike Cruz uh, for people who don't know me and I also serve on Chuck. I wanted to just express my sincere gratitude for, uh, for the proclamation. These are trying times as, uh, as Ruth has pointed out. Um, between the census and COVID, um, I really, really value the acknowledgement. Uh, we also have, of course, Black Lives Matter. So having the county acknowledge um, the Hispanic community in this way is tremendously meaningful. And I would just like to thank you for uh, putting us on the agenda. Thank you for moving this forward. And thank you for um, certainly for having Chuck as one of the uh, diversity councils. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. I, I saw that you were on there, so I'm so glad that, uh, that you were able to speak. And thank you for your service um, on the chalk and um, in your several community roles. We really appreciate that. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Well, we have outstanding Hispanic leaders. You've just heard from a couple of them and we have a vibrant um, Hispanic Latino community. And this is a wonderful time to be able to recognize that the contributions of Latinos through the years, whether that's um, Latinos who have been here for uh, 500 years, for five centuries or Latinos who are recent immigrants. We can find examples throughout our community of the many contributions. Uh, my I have the honor of coming from a Hispanic pioneer family who um, have been here in Flagstaff for five generations and um, have the honor of serving as the first Latina member of the Coconino County Board of Supervisors. And so um, it is important that we put forth this proclamation and that we call upon all Coconino County residents to uh, reflect on the contributions of Hispanics, Latinos um, during this 30 days that are set aside. Um, I really am happy to see the variety of offerings um, to really allow the county and our, our residents and our county organization, our team members to uh, learn more about uh, the diversity of the Hispanic uh, culture, Latino culture, because it is 
very diverse um, to learn about the to learn about some of the uh, ways that we express ourselves, whether that be through food, through celebrations, through stories. Um, but more important is just sitting down and trying to understand one another's point of view. As, as some of the speakers has mentioned, um, now more than ever is when we need to come together um, as a community and recognize the contributions that we bring recognize the value that each person has in our community. And so I'm very excited that um, we will be having these 30 days to have some, some difficult conversations about, um, about what makes us um, unique, what, um, our, what, what, are we, what, what, our, what our differences are, um, what is happening in terms of um, just uh, policies, whether that be on immigration or whether that be on um, Black Lives Matter um, and the contributions of, of people of color. And so these are all really important conversations and I'm so glad that the county is setting um, the example of not being afraid to have these conversations um, to bring us together in uh, unity to be able to learn from one another. So thank you for that. Anybody else who wishes to comment? Okay, well, we look forward to being part of um, Hispanic Heritage Month with all of you. Chair Archuleta, if I may just yes. mention quickly that we have um, Dal Mendoza and Tracy Gleason Harvey on the call, both from NAU. So I just wanted to take a moment and thank them for also being here today. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know that this is uh, takes time from what you're doing. And so we appreciate you joining us at our meeting today. I appreciate your support um, of Coconino County and of Hispanic Heritage Month. So Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Supervisor Fowler. Thank you uh, for bringing this item to the board. I know that as a board that we really appreciate the um, diversity council, um, councils, and i um, really happy that we are recognizing the, the Heritage Month this and, and that how it is, um, we just need to make sure that we are, we remember that we are all diverse and all the different spices that we bring in and the, just the way that our cultures are, our language differences, it just makes us a richer community. So I just want to thank you. And for some reason, you know, the, um, the colored, the brown people, the, just the colored people, our challenges become politics. And politically, it just um, creates it stirs up things and, and, but even with all that, we just have to keep on moving forward and addressing some of the issues that, uh, some of the challenges that are before us. And that's what you're doing. You're addressing the issues that need to be addressed. And I want to thank you. I think that takes a lot of courage to put on educational events, to be able to speak up and, um, whether it's with your writing, with your voice, or events that you that we hold, so I just really want to thank you for that, and thank you so much for all your work, um, and just the various community members from various agencies, just getting involved and making sure that we are we have our voice out there. So thank you so much. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Supervisor Parks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I have a Hispanic heritage as well. My my family hasn't been here for 500 years, but they've been here for a little over 200 years in, in what we now call Arizona. My my uh, Spanish ancestors came came up through Mexico from from Spain uh, back in the 1720s or so. And uh, I do have some Native American heritage also along at that time. Uh, I echo Supervisor Fowler's comments about um, 
about how things get political. And it seems that sometimes that we are attempting to divide these, these uh, the, the people that are here uh, into groups. And that uh, is disturbing to me because my, my own heritage, I don't look like I'm Hispanic. I don't look like I'm Native American because my, my genetics has been watered down by Irish and Welsh and Scotch Celts and English and several other German and whatnot. So, but I still am proud of my Hispanic heritage. Um, my grandmother instilled that in us when I was a child. She talked about our, our Hispanic heritage a lot. She got us to know who our ancestors were from the, from the Santa Cruz family that came here early, early on and the Bohorkas family that I'm descended from down through the Welsh and, and uh, Scotch and Irish and English Celts and, and um, all the rest of the, the melting pot uh, parts of me that I am in my bloodline. So I want to commend you all for, for um, being uh, on this chalk uh, program and, and, and organization. And uh, thank you for, thank you for um, making sure that the Spanish culture, our Spanish culture and our Spanish heritage continues and continues on to our children and our grandchildren and, and and on down the line for, for the next several centuries. Um, I guess I've, I've kind of run out of air here. I, I appreciate all of you very much. Thank you for your, your contribution and thank you for your hard work. And thank you for this proclamation. Um, Great, thank you, Supervisor Parks. Well, wonderful. Plus, muchas gracias. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to participating in the events. We're now going to go to our consent agenda. This is um, consent agenda is made up of many items. These are either items that the Board of Supervisors has had a presentation on before or they're administrative in nature. Thus, we vote on them in one action unless there's um, a board member who wants to consider an item separately. Board members, is there any item that you would like to consider separately? Otherwise, I will ask for a motion to approve consent agenda items four through eight. Madam Chair, I, I move that we approve the uh, consent agenda from number four through eight. Okay, is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items four through eight. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, passes unanimously. We will um, now go to a recess and um, we will pick up with um, the agenda items nine through 11 and action item number 12 at one, excuse me, after uh, this afternoon. And so we have a recess until 1.15. When we come back from our recess, the first presentation will be a presentation and discussion with Coconino County Treasurer Benatar regarding um, an annual update and economic outlook. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, we will see you this afternoon at 1.15 for those who will be participating. Thank you all. Thank you.
I don't know why I don't do it. Are you on? Hi, Mr. Glassman, can you hear me? No, I can't. Okay. We can't, I can't really hear you. So I just wanted to check and see, we can test out your microphone or your audio. There, it looks like you're unmuted. It's just your volume, I think is really low. There you go. Is that better? That there you go. It's working. Yeah, the problem is when I plug my headphone, my headsets in. I don't know every every Zoom call is different. Uh, yeah. I can't get I can't get it to um, go through my earphones. So whatever. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you though. We can see you. We can hear you. So okay, good. Right. Okay. I if I can get the volume up here. <laughs> uh, where do I? How do I shrink this? Where is the volume? Why can't I? Why can't? Which? Where is my volume? God. Audio settings, speakers. Volume is high, okay. Volume. Wow, every one of these is different. Jim, 
What do you need? What are you trying to do? Let's see if we can figure trying it to get out. The volume, I'm trying to get my volume up, but I guess I'll have to live with this. Can you not hear us okay? I can hear you fine, but it's quieter. Usually I use the uh, earbuds and they seem to work fine, but on this on this particular one, they're not working. So that's all right. I'll figure it. It'll, we'll figure it out. There we go. Okay. Volume. That's hundred percent. Okay. Sarah, is there anyone else that um, should be a panelist on here? Um, it's just going to be Jim and I doing the actual speaking and sharing screen. So it no, just Jim and I. Yeah. You know, All right. Sarah, I might skip trying to share the pictures because I'm going to have a hard time going back and forth here. It looks like. Um, Do so you I'll want just, me to have something up? Because I have your presentation. Through, I'll talk through it. Um, there's a picture that shows, I don't remember where it is. Um, it shows GDP, where we are now versus where we could have been. And I think it's down in the middle somewhere, but I don't, I don't need it. I'll just talk through it. Are you sure? I really don't mind. I can have it up. It says something like um, for 85% to 95%, it's a picture of um, two lines and a shaded area. Um, two lines, one which got, let me see if I can, GDP and it's showing you where we are now versus where we would have been. And do you have a page? Do you have, have lost. Do you have a page number by any chance? You know the page numbers are all screwed up, so it's probably uh, it's probably somewhere down there in the seventeen. It's um, I think the headline says something like from eighty five percent to ninety five percent. You see that? Eighty five. It's the only one I need if, if it's the only one I'll use if um, if you can't find it, it's not a big deal. Found it from 85% to 95% yeah, by Labor Day? Yeah, but that Got one. It. I don't know why I'm having um, issues. Every Zoom is different. There must be many versions out there. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Well, I feel like every day, like technology is just. I know Something it's happened <laughs> and they and they keep changing stuff and don't tell you what you have to do and then you waste time trying to figure out when they make changes why don't they just let you do it the way you were used to doing it and then give you something else it's crazy microsoft is good at that <laughs> they change everything you're not sure why it's better but it's different <laughs> Let's see if I exit full screen, I get all of you guys, right? Where's the um, metro full screen? Hmm. Oh, well, I'll just have it on you. Okay. Well, and if you, you know, need me to change, just let me know. I can always move this through. That's okay. okay. I'll just. But I've got that up for. Okay. For that's, that's the only one I use. There's, there's some other ones, but um, I'll just talk through them. It's sometimes clumsy to use pictures on Zoom calls, so I just have gotten used to not doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're my. I'm between me and you. Most my favorite quarter um, between Joshua Tree, but Joshua Tree, and the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. My North favorite. Rim is beautiful. Um, I'll just talk through them. You it's know, sometimes clumsy to I guess it's pictures on Zoom calls, so I just have gotten used to not doing it. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, you're my I'm I thought your parts are pretty full, full, right? Me and you most my favorite quarter um between Joshua Tree, but Joshua Tree Why is that guy coming in there? <laughs> North Grand Canyon, Canyon. My favorite. That's beautiful. Um, I'll just talk through them. You know, some... I 
Do you I guys have no idea what that was? Okay, I was like, did did we met? I what? <laughs> there was a nice uh, replay there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, just so you know, that was the YouTube. We are still live on YouTube during recess. So just so you're aware. Ah. I have a bunch of neighbors um, that just drove all the way over there to Bryce and um, they said it was jammed. I have not, oh, and I think they're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. We are uh, reconvening after our lunch recess. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. This is the meeting of the Coconino County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, today, September 1st. And um, on our schedule for this afternoon is an update and um, economic outlook presentation from our treasurer, Coconino County Treasurer, Sarah Benatar. And she also has a a guest with her, Mr. Glassman, who she will introduce. Introduce. Let me just, um, for the purpose of the public, convene that we, I mean, excuse me, uh, confirm that we do have a quorum of the Board of Supervisors present. I'm Liz Archuleta, the chair of the board. I also represent District 2. Uh, Supervisor Parks. Present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Fowler. Madam Chair, she'll be rejoining in about two seconds. She's just been promoted. That's fine. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. We'll just wait till she gets on to ensure we have a quorum. Okay, and I do see her present. Vice Chair Fowler, do you just want to acknowledge that you're present? Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. And of course, we have uh, several members of our county team, including uh, County Manager uh, Jimmy Jane, as well as our deputy county managers present, Lucinda Andriani, Dr. Marie Peoples, and uh, we have other guests that are in attendance. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Treasurer Benatar. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so before I turn it over to our guests today, I just wanted to give a couple of updates uh, are, we just ended fiscal year 20 and I uh, wanted just to go over a couple items that were in the treasurer's annual report to the board that was submitted back in August or earlier this month or last month. I'm sorry, everything, I forgot today's the first already of September. Um, so at the end of the fiscal year, we had just under $260 million on deposit with our office of that, uh, just over 235 million were tied up in investments. As you can see, the bulk of the money on deposit belongs to our school districts, followed by the county and county departments, and then special districts, which includes hospital districts, fire districts, sanitary districts, et cetera. Um, our investment portfolio at fiscal year end was uh, average 1.52% for the fiscal year. Uh, that was great. We did see some um, great rate of returns prior to COVID. Um, at the end of FY20, so on June 30th, 2020, the two-year treasury, which we use as a benchmark, as we keep our portfolio duration at about two years, was at 0.16%. Um, we are seeing interest rates go down. We had staggered our portfolio. So we are actually doing um, fairly well. We did have some positions that were uh, bullet um, agency bonds, for example, that kept a high yield and won't be called until uh, a year or two from now. So um, hopefully that will sustain us with um, a little bit more interest, but I will keep um, the board and the districts updated on our um, investments as we go through the fiscal year. So our collection rate was down compared to prior years. Um, 
So we had a 97% collection rate, which sounds great, um, but we haven't seen a collection rate this low since um, fiscal year 12, which was tax year 2011. Um, so for us, if we've got a 1% decrease, that's almost $2 million in um, property taxes that we did not collect. So we're keeping a very close eye on this. And that leads me to a special project that um, we have been working on the last several months with CoreLogic. So CoreLogic is a financial property and consumer analytics company. Um, they do a lot of research analysis um, in uh, property taxes, um, in the mortgage industry. And so they actually also pay for about 70, 75% of the different um, or property taxes were up 70 to 75 percent of the uh, lenders um, in escrow companies for our county. So it's pretty significant. Um, we approached them back in March to analyze our data to see what trends they're seeing in property tax delinquencies as well as uh, mortgage defaults and that led to a multi-month partnership. Um, we are the first in the country to actually um, get this level of data analysis from them. And they are using um, the work that we've done over the last several months um, to roll out at a state level and across the country. So we're what I'm about to walk you through for recapping our property tax collections um, is a result of this partnership um, with CoreLogic. And we're, like I said, we're the first that has this and the first that has this level of analysis. So I'm very excited to show and walk you through this. So um, tax year 2019 delinquent parcels, 60% of the delinquencies we had at fiscal year end belong to second half 2019 taxes, um, which is higher than we typically see. And there was a total of uh, 3,160 parcels delinquent at the fiscal year end. As you can see, the bulk of that is single family residents, um, followed by vacant land, and then condos, duplexes, apartments, hotel, motel, and other. Um, I do want to point out that although hotel, motel makes up a small um, percentage in terms of number of parcels, they do make up a larger dollar amount. Um, but still the largest dollar amount in delinquent taxes belongs to single family residences, which is a little bit of a concern for us as we go into the next property tax season. We just um, uploaded the tax roll last night. And so we are getting ready for our 2020 tax season. So getting a good understanding of what happened in 19 as a result of COVID is helping us analyze what we feel the collection rates will be. Um, what we saw is, so we were able, CoreLogic was able to break down to us by industry or property type, um, what the delinquencies were. And as you can see, so the gray are properties that were actually delinquent um, at this point last year, or sorry, at fiscal year 2019 end, and then also delinquent again um, in fiscal 20. So essentially those who have been late in paying their property taxes. The red are brand new delinquencies that had not been delinquent before, which as you can see, there's a lot of red on the screen and that's a bit alarming for us. Um, as we see, especially in the single family residents, um, I separated this out because that amount was much greater than the other ones, but vacant land, um, commercial property, hotel, retail, across the board, all sectors saw an increase in brand new delinquencies for 2019 taxes. And I should say that's the second half 2019 taxes is what we were focusing on because that was where COVID had impacted. So this is a comparison um, of our county for FY 2019 fiscal year end and FY 20 fiscal year end. And I wanna thank GIS for having done this so quickly for us. So the dark blue is just a lower number of parcels in that community that were delinquent. Then it goes to this brighter blue, then yellow, then orange, then red. So if you compare the two maps, you can see, for example, Tucson didn't really have that many delinquencies last year. This year, we're starting to see a blue. So we're starting to see an increase. You go down to Sedona, they had some, um, but it was in the lower range. You're now starting to see they're moving up um, into that more um, moderate range of delinquencies. 
And then even in city of Flagstaff, you can see um, we didn't have any red, which is a very high percentage of delinquencies. We now have seen a significant red in city limits, which is a bit concerning. And that's consistent across um, the county. If you look at Page, they are now seeing a more moderate level of delinquency. Fredonia, Williams, um, even down in the Blue Ridge area as well. So this really points for us that this is a situation and a trend that's happening across the county. Um, so I do wanna point out that our partnership with CoreLogic is going to continue. Um, they are analyzing our data monthly and we'll be providing um, updates on this with us um, and we'll be continuing to work with them as we start to re-see in the 2020 taxes. So we have real-time data. Um, they're also looking to see if they can provide something similar with mortgage defaults. Of course, that's a bit more of an interesting situation given um, the current uh, moratoriums going on um, with mortgages and, and there's not really that many defaults, but they're planning on trying to find us some data so we can get a better grasp for this. Um, so that leads me to our office has decided to create a task force focusing on home ownership and mortgage markets, specifically property tax and mortgage defaults. Um, and the reason is we see something is coming. We want to be prepared. We want to make sure that we're relying on experts in our community to help guide our office and some of the work that we're doing. Um, and so members of our task force right now are Sarah Dar, who's the housing director for City of Flagstaff. Charlie Dowdy, who is the managing attorney for DNA People's Legal Services, Carol Dykes, the president and CEO of United Way of Northern Arizona, Mark Manoil, who is an attorney out of Phoenix um, and is also a member of the National Tax Lien Association, uh, Devonna McLaughlin, the CEO of Housing Solutions, and then from the county, we have Chris Pastors, who's the economic development manager, and um, Stacey Prickett, who is the back tax specialist for the treasurer's office. So um, I want to give a big thank you to this group. Um, we're just getting started and uh, it's you know unique in the sense that we are focusing on home ownership for this property or for this task force, as opposed to just the big housing in general. And with that, um, that brings me to what I'm personally very excited um, to hear or who I'm very personally excited to hear from is uh, Jim Glassman. Uh, so when I reached out to JP Morgan, I was very excited to hear that Jim had volunteered to do this for us. Um, so a big shout out to our um, partners at JP Morgan, um, Jay Myers, who's the managing director and industry manager for government in the Intermountain region, and Dan Warren, who's the executive director and exec relationship executive in government banking here in Arizona for helping make this happen. Um, so Jim is the managing director and head economist uh, for commercial banking at JP Morgan. Uh, he is very, very experienced um, in this field, having worked with several banks and also having worked with the Federal Reserve Board. Um, he has his PhD in economics from Northwestern University, and I am not going to take much more time. I'm going to turn it over to Jim and let him speak because he's got a lot more insights than I do. And I know he's really where, who we all want to hear from. So thank you, Jim, for being here today. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> yeah, I wish experience made you a better forecaster, but it seems like every episode is so different. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, you know, a, a couple thoughts for you on the delinquency issue. Um, there, there's a couple things to keep in mind, and I don't know, you might have better insights into this than I do. Um, I think when we see stresses building, delinquencies, things like that, we immediately we go back to the crisis, the, the, the previous cycle, the housing issues. And we worry that this is the, th this is reminiscent of what happened. I think there, there, there are two big differences here. If you remember, um, you may not remember, but uh, 12 years ago in the financial crisis, a lot of that um, delinquency and the financial stress came because that, that, that phenomenon was very different than what we're dealing with right now. People were speculating in housing. Uh, honestly, I saw a lot of New Yorkers who had 
Scottsdale property on their screensavers. Um, people were speculating in property and they had no equity in the house. And so when the property values dropped, um, you saw a lot of delinquencies and people walking from mortgages. I think if you look at what's going on now, you know, the loan standards are much different. People have equity in their houses. And it's unlikely to me that people are walking from places or being delinquent on managing their mortgages if they've got a lot of equity in the house. So it makes me wonder, um, I don't know whether this affects property tax delinquencies, but the forbearance uh, guidelines are an issue. Because if you're, if you're given the option of postponing payment for a year, for giving payment for a loan, why, for a payment for a year, why would you not do it? Uh, you're not, you know, you're just postponing a payment. So I, I, I first thought of this when I think it was the, um, uh, someone reported a big increase in, in delinquencies in the second quarter. Well, first of all, the second quarter is a real nightmare. But honestly, when you see delinquencies happening at a time when the federal government and the state government are um, allowing forbearance, uh, you sort of wonder what's is that what it's about or something else. So, I mean, and one thing, one thing that I've always thought, you know, <clears throat> this crisis led. We've seen a lot of unemployment, and when economists see unemployment like this, your tendency is to think, oh my gosh, this is all that financial distress that you normally associate with rising unemployment. It makes you think about all these cycles in your past. The problem is what we're dealing with right now has nothing, there's nothing in our history books that looks anything like this. And the big difference is that yes, there's a lot of unemployment, but because we've taken huge policy actions to protect people, to replace the income they aren't earning in weight and you know, lost wages, what it means is that the income, despite all the, un the unemployment, the income that people are getting, thanks to the help from the federal government, which is you've got huge income transfers, is making people whole. And it's making it easier for people to honor their financial obligations. So I've never seen anything quite like it, actually. We, with, for all this unemployment, if you look at the income statement of the household sector in America, it looks like the fiscal response from Washington basically gave all of those folks who were on the front lines, the waiters, the people who work at the bars, the fitness centers, basically, effectively, it's giving us paid leave temporarily and, and a bonus. With that's, and I'm thinking of the checks in the mail, the supplement to the unemployment insurance system, the creation of a special program for people who are Uber drivers and gig, you know, work in the gig economy. Uh, those folks, sadly, are doing better uh, on unemployment than they might have in their jobs. And, but, but, the, but the good thing about that is it makes me think, well, if we've, if we've taken action to try to replace the income that people aren't earning, then from an income point of view, they have every reason, they have the resources to manage their financial obligations. And honestly, when you look at what's going on in the economy, that's the way to understand why consumer spending is doing what it's doing. It's off the charts. Uh, it's leading the economic recovery. So getting to getting to the um, back to the economy, I think it's important to remember where we were when we started just before this crisis. We were in a position that was pretty amazing. the The U.S. economy was in an amazing place, three and a half percent unemployment, and we weren't seeing inflation problems. And by the way, this was an important backdrop to why the Fed is becoming much more relaxed about the way they manage inflation. You heard this from, uh, from Jay Powell yesterday. Um, from my point of view, from most of us economists, we're not used to the idea that you could describe a US economy where unemployment is three and a half percent. We're not used to describing that as a sustainable situation. And yet it was because there was no real inflation problem. So it's important to know that when we came into this crisis, there was nothing really fundamentally wrong with the economy. We were in a good spot. And the Fed people kept walk, they kept telling you that the economy is in a good spot. So I think what that tells you is when this crisis is going to play differently. So, so when we ask businesses to turn out the lights and ask people to stay home, um, it didn't take long to figure out this was going to be a real problem for the economy. And the, the thing that's important to remember 
is that when we, when we shuttered businesses, restaurants, bars, fitness centers, the airline system, it's the folks who work in those industries that bore the brunt of this. So if you look at a, there's a company called Homebase that keeps track of trends in the small business community. And what they were telling us was through the month of March and into mid-April, 65% of the jobs at small business establishments were shut out. So that meant to me, there were 40 million people who were furloughed. They didn't have jobs to go to. They didn't, they weren't fired. They just had no job to go to. So what did they do? They rushed to unemployment insurance. And when you, when you look at all those numbers of people, the unemployed piling up in the offices to get unemployment benefits, those were the guys. These were the folks who were working at the restaurants and the bars and the fitness centers. Most of us um, were able to transition from our office job to work from home, um, you know, work on work remote on the computer. So I think I think that was really helpful actually because um, at the time when this all began to unravel around mid March, we all were debating: Is this going to turn into a regular business cycle, which can take years to get out of, or is this going to look and feel more like a natural disaster? And my feeling was, you're supposed to think about this. This is going to look and feel, follow the dynamic of a natural disaster. And the more that Washington can respond to help protect the people who were losing jobs, the more it would look like a natural disaster. So what I had in mind was something like, if this was a normal business cycle with unemployment where it is, I, I, would, I would have said, you know, this could be 10 years before we get back on our feet. But because it looks and feels like a natural disaster to me. We cause the problem. We ask people not to, to stay home and we ask people to turn out the lights because our hospitals didn't have the capacity to take, handle yet another wave of sick people when they were already full with flu patients. So we had to do it. I understand why we did it. We've never done it before, but, it, but, but that's what caused the problem. So to me, what made me a lot more comfortable, by the time you got to late March, by the time the CARES Act was passed, and it's amazing to me that we were able to get those kind of initiatives from a Washington that's very polarized. But both, we had bipartisan support for actions that authorized the release of up to $4 trillion of money to be spent. A lot of it to protect, to, 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 to provide the income for people who were losing jobs. So to me, what made it easy to figure this out, and I think the, the reason Congress is able to get so focused is because we knew who the we knew who the victims would be, the guys that are working in the places that were being asked to shut down. And I think they did an amazing job. And I think because of what they did, you kind of knew when you when you were when you when you thought about what all that was going to do for the for the worker, for the household, you kind of knew it would take time but that we would start to see that, that, that all that was being done was going to give households the resources, the wherewithal to protect them for the lost wages. And when we let people go back to work, let them start up again. So uh, long story short, when you think about the economy, the way I think about, I mean, right now we're, we're all kind of worried because we don't know if Congress is going to be able to come up with another initiative to replace the benefits that expired at the end of July. I'm not as worried about that myself for the following reason. If you think about what, what happened, what, what I'm showing you on this picture, that top line is showing you where we economists think our economy would have been had we not had the crisis. So that's GDP. It starts in February and it, it extrapolates out. And the, and the solid line is what's actually happened. That's GDP. It declined in, um, March and April, and it began to turn around in May. Amazing, two months later. Um, and right now, we don't, we don't know July yet. We'll know in the next couple of days. Uh, this, is a, this, this estimate is consistent with the government's quarterly GDP number. Macroeconomic Advisors puts this together and it's consistent with the national GDP. And I think what, what it tells you, based on what we've seen with consumer spending and the labor market data so far, I think what it tells you is when the economy unraveled in March and into mid-April, we, we lost ground and national output fell to about 85% of our desired level. 
And that's what the, all the unemployment was all about. Then in May and June, we began to rebound really amazingly. In July, we're probably gonna be up another one and a half percent. I think what, what those three dots are telling you is that by Labor Day, I think you could, you'll be able to say that our economy has recovered back to 95% of our desired level. So this is, one, this is one way of saying, this is the dynamic you don't expect to see in a business cycle. This is what you expect to see if you're in the middle of a natural disaster. I think of uh, New Orleans and Katrina. Uh, Katrina slams New Orleans, tears it apart. The nation mobilizes resources to help New Orleans get back on its feet. Five months later, unemployment is back to where it began. Well, part of the reason for that, by the way, was because a lot of people scattered to Houston and Baton Rouge. But within two years, employment in New Orleans had returned to where it was before the crisis. So that's that's kind of that's not a business cycle. That's a natural disaster phenomenon that you get when you put a lot of resources into helping the economy. Now, the shaded area is trying to show you. Why it is, I think we've done a lot to handle the lost output. What that is doing, I'm accumulating the total amount of lost income given where we are at any moment in time versus where we would have been. That shaded area is accumulating the difference between those two lines. So that's, that's a measure of the lost income that we've suffered with the economy tumbling into, you know, back in March and April. And what it tells you is that as of right now, the total amount of lost wages is probably about $750 billion. By the time we get to Labor Day, maybe we're getting close to $800 billion in total. And if everything progresses the way this picture is hoping we do, uh, we get back to back on our feet by the end of next year or 2021, then the total lost, the total estimate of the damage, lost income, is a little more than a trillion dollars. Well, keep that in mind. When you think about what Congress did, Congress authorized in those four initiatives, they authorized the release of up to $4 trillion of resources, helping the healthcare system, checks in the mail, supplements to the unemployment insurance system, special program for the gig workers. And so it makes me think that, well, when, you know, there's gonna be a lot of people that, are, we haven't been able to help because we, it's hard to imagine all the people that are disrupted by this. But what this tells me is in those early days of the crisis, we really did a lot. We went a long way to uh, taking care of the lost income that we would be suffering as a result of this. So to me, this is one of the reasons that this, this picture is sort of telling you, this is why it feels like a natural disaster. It's why the stock market is doing so much better. It's why the job market is rebounding. That PPP program that helps small businesses um, pay for workers if they keep them on the books for two months, forgivable loans, all of that has helped. That, that, that program should have been sufficient to basically cover everybody who works for a small business. Um, the 650 billion that they authorized to be spent on that program. And I think that's why we're seeing so much recovery in so the recovery of the job market doing so well. And the most amazing thing, the, 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 what you're seeing on the consumer side is a testimony to the help that we gave people who were furloughed. Retail sales plunged, as, as you would have guessed, March and April. Uh, by June, they were back fully to where they were before the crisis. Consumer spending by the, by the time we got to July, almost back to where we were. So what that tells you is, whatever that, that, that the labor market situation is not what you normally see. All this unemployment, it's, it's, it's scary when you see it, but because we are giving people, replacing the income they were losing, we're basically giving them, paying them for the time off and they have the resources. So now when we let them go back to work, um, they have the income to spend. And that's why the consumer sector is really driving a lot of the revival in the economy. Um, and I think because we're all staying home, um, anyone who's in the business of um, you know, home improvements, for example, all of our clients that are in the re residential industry or home improvements, they're just having a hard time keeping up with demand. 
because we're all spending more time at home. Now, so all of that, all of that is a long-winded way of saying we got over the first hurdle. That all that disruption caused by the quarantines and asking people to stay at home, it it created a lot of havoc in the job market. But we are pretty much compensating people for that. The real challenge, I think, is um, now between now and the vaccine. And I think, and it's turning out. I never thought about this in the early days, but it's turning out that the biggest challenge really is for the school systems and for the municipalities. Municipalities, which are dependent on tourism. So, so here's what's interesting. When you, when you look around the country, what you'll, what you'll see is that most states, the tax collections for most states, somewhere between five and 6% of their GDP is what most states collect. But everybody does this differently. Some don't have an income tax. Some have low income tax rates. And those who don't have an income tax or low income tax, they have to depend more on sales taxes. So the guys that depend on sales taxes, and Arizona is near the top of the list of that because Arizona's income tax is not as burdensome as, say, California or New Jersey or New York. So what, what happens is the states. This crisis, because of the way we're dealing with it, we're making sure we're trying to help people replace the income they're, they, they've lost by being furloughed. The income is holding up pretty well. The problem is that because everyone's afraid to fly, we're not traveling as much. Um, you look at passenger flows through Phoenix, through LAX, through Atlanta, it's just, it's running one eighth of what it normally is. And what that means is, we're not seeing the tourism. And when you're not seeing the tourism, it's hurting the communities that depend a lot on tourism, particularly in the summer months. And that's why sales taxes, when I look at the, the picture for municipalities in the aggregate, the sales tax hit is down about 50 billion at an annual rate uh, in the second quarter. And to me, that's really connected to the air travel business. And if, you know, if it were me, I would think, you know, I've, I've been flying a couple times in the last couple of months. It has become a very sanitary place to be. The airlines have gone a long way to cleaning up, to take, making sure that's a safe place. And everybody's very careful. If it were me, I would be offering everybody a month of free travel just to get people back on the planes to make them understand that it's okay because we're all deathly afraid of getting on an airplane because we're worried about the, the, the exposure to other people. But I think until air travel returns to something more normal, the municipalities are gonna be struggling. Your, your sales taxes are gonna be struggling. So in order, you know, to, so, so to see some kind of hope there, it may, it may be that we don't get much improvement there until we get the vaccine. And then people begin to get more comfortable flying because I think if you're, I mean, our, our, you know, the biggest worry I see people on the planes, it's not for themselves. They're worried that they might get something that exposed their parents or their grandparents. And so you want to keep them safe. So I, I think between, between that phenomenon, and I never thought about, we, we all assume that once we let the businesses open up again, and they are, we're all figuring it out. And honestly, for, for a long time, I thought the restaurants and bars would have the toughest time. But I, I look around and I see Local communities are letting restaurants spill out onto the streets. And now when I walk around at night to in the restaurant area, it's looking very normal. And I think the real, so I, I think the real challenge that we're all realizing is the biggest problem is schools, what they're dealing with, because you're, you're sending your kids, mom and dad have to go to work. And if the kids are at home and they have to manage virtual classrooms, that's a nightmare. And, uh, and I think, um, Everybody's struggling to figure out how do you go back to life, but protect the kids. And I think the only way really, frankly, is just to do a real aggressive testing, which is why I think University of Illinois and Cornell, I thought would set the pattern. Their intention was to bring kids back. Mr. Glassman, you you're um, basically frozen, so we don't have audio from you.
Let's see, maybe you can try closing out your video and just audio to maybe jump start it. Okay, we may have lost him, but hold on, everyone. Mr. Glassman, there we go. Back. We need to unmute Mr. Glassman. Okay, thank you. There you go. Green saber. That's what I hate about this. <laughs> so oh, right. This is the problem. When, it, when you don't move your thing around, it goes to sleep. So here, so I think the biggest the biggest challenge we have right now, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic that the economy has done a really good job getting back. We, we can't really expect that we're going to get fully back on our feet, though, until we get the medical answer. But I think the biggest challenge for the next several months is going to be all those communities that are that 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 depend on the school system. So yeah, we parents, the parents are struggling because we've got to balance things and we've got to watch our kids and and we're you know, we're trying to figure out how to work that. The problem is if you do virtual classes, there's a huge network. There's like 5,000 communities that depend on colleges and universities for their livelihood. And if you're running virtual classes, you don't need all that support system. And I heard this from my alma mater when they they were gonna go virtual classrooms. And then the next thing I heard from them is they're furloughing 4,500 people who, who do all that service work. So I think, I think that's the biggest challenge economically is that um, virtual classrooms, we can all get used to. We don't like it, but we can get, we can get used to it. But if you're gonna run a virtual class, you just don't need all the services. And that's a livelihood for people. And it's real hard to figure out how do you help those people? Because there's so many ancillary businesses that are connected to schools and you can't, you can't really, it takes a long time to figure out who, how, how to help those folks. So I, I think, I still, I think for all that we've done, there's still a lot of work to do. I think we, I think Congress went really, did a, did a really good job in the early days of authorizing lots of money to protect people who were furloughed. The problem is, now we're trying to figure out how do you protect the businesses that had to make a go of it at a time of social distancing. And it's very tough when you got to keep people distanced. So I think we'll make it. I think the only, I mean, the only, the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel here is that we're getting very close, I think, to a medical answer. And, and it's all moving very much faster than people told you it would be happening. At the start of the year, everyone said, oh, look, these things can take a year or two. And everybody was talking about the 1918 flu season, the flu epidemic. I don't know why that was relevant. That's hundred years ago. And life is very different from hundred years ago. I'll tell you, people, people didn't have airplanes back then to move around and they didn't have computers to simulate the, you know, once you know the genome of this virus. So we're, we're moving much faster. And I think the whole world is very focused on trying to come up with an answer. And I think, Within weeks, actually, we're going to know a lot. And, and meanwhile, meanwhile, the treatment of the disease is getting better, apparently, because when you look at the number of, the, the number of cases versus the fatalities, there's something important happening, and we're learning how to deal with this a lot better. So, um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. I, per, I personally think um, we got to know it's going to be very challenging for the balance of the year, but I really think. Um, we have a very good shot of getting back close to where we were, if not by the end of next year, sometime in 2021. And I, and I, think, I think one of the, in a subtle way, one of the helpful things going on here is coming from the Fed. The Fed, the Fed has got policy very aggressive, and they're telling you that they've changed the way they're going to manage things. They're going to be much more relaxed about how they, how they handle how they think about inflation, they're going to be more tolerant. And what that means is rates are going to stay lower longer, unfortunately for those who have to get dependent on investment income, lower longer and be more cautious in normalizing interest rates. And, but but from, a, from a broad economic point of view, that means um, it, it's hard to appreciate this, but when you have the ability to keep interest rates artificially low, that, that is a very powerful weapon and it, and it works. We have a long history of seeing how it works. And I think all of that together with uh, what Washington's been doing is gonna get us back. 
And I think, I think that's one small way of understanding what's going on in the equity market. I, I think, you know, obviously it's not just that the economy is rebounding as quick as anybody would imagine. It's also that the crisis is uh, forcing us to move to technology faster and people are getting more comfortable with doing a lot more things in technology. So it's the technology sector that's doing better. But honestly, if I had told you back in March, don't worry, by Labor Day, the stock market is going to be back to where we began, you would have been very skeptical. And I, and I think the stock market's obviously driven by a lot of things, but I think it echoes, I, I think a lot of these themes, the idea that what we're living with here is nothing like what we've ever seen before. And it's going to look and feel more like a natural disaster, which means turbulent, but back on our feet much quicker than normal. I think that's uh, an important idea that's percolating in the background of the equity market. So let me let me stop there if you have any questions. Great, well, thank you so much, Mr. Glassman. And I would like to reserve this time for questions. We have about 15 minutes for it and I'll go ahead and start it. First of all, just wanna thank you for joining us. Wanna thank Treasurer Benatar for uh, asking you to be with us this afternoon. We very much appreciate your time and the insight you've provided. So, um, so just a, a a couple of questions and first just a comment. So I certainly agree that local governments um, have been hit the most. I would, I would say that county governments have been hit the most um, because we, Coconino County does uh, depend tremendously on yeah. tourism and, uh, and sales taxes. Um, we, and on, in addition to, and in addition to that, um, the response to COVID the testing, the uh, meeting community needs, the protection of public health, um, the purchasing of PPE, I mean, you name it, the entire response to COVID has been on the backs of counties. So we have bared that burden and we have frankly spent the, you know, the millions of dollars um, to respond yeah. to COVID without even, know if, without even knowing if we'll be reimbursed, you know, from the federal government or from state government. And so, um, we certainly are bearing the burden of that. Um, so I just wanted to go back to you talked about jobs and talking about some people are making more money now than they had in the past, unfortunately. Um, and by having the um, not only the the checks that were sent to them, but the you know pandemic unemployment um, assistance. So what's going to happen when that stops and people go back to what they're what they were making before? Um, you know, are we still going to see the uptick in, in economic recovery? And then I think along with that is um, people who are renting right now, there's a, a moratorium on the rental payments, but that is still, that's cumulative, right? It's building up. And so instead right. of people owing one month of rent, they now owe, you know, six months of rent. Um, and so that's going to be due, you know, all in one lump sum. And so then we're going to see what we're projecting is we're going to see, you know, more people who will be evicted and that then is going to put additional stress on need for social services for emergency assistance, housing assistance, utility assistance, et cetera. And so can you give us a little bit of like, I'm trying to understand, you know, those realities and then with, you know, the optimistic viewpoint that we're going to recover quicker than one might, th one might think. Yeah, I think the sad thing is that for most of us were not disrupted by this. Most of us were able to transition quickly from, from office to home. And most people are in that position. And that's, it's, the, it's the folks that have to be on the job that are the problem. The, the, the folks that have to be in the restaurants, that have to be at the bars, that have to be in the fitness centers. And um, that's going to be, I mean, the sooner we can get those people back in their jobs and employed, the less you would worry about the financial distress for them. The problem is they have run out of the benefits. On July 31st, that extra benefit, the $600 expired. Now, some people say, well, I have, I have clients, business clients who say, because people were compensated so well, they were reluctant to come back to the job right away. Um, now, I think there may be an incentive to do that, but I think it's, it, you know, what, what happened is really, I talked to a lot of folks, my daughter uh, and all her friends. Uh, I can tell there's, 
there's a lot, you know, th this is a, it's a difficult thing because people are asking, why are you willing to compensate me more when I don't have a job than when I go back to my job? And it's, it's creating a lot of frustration. I think it's gonna create a lot of frustration. How do you deal with that? Honestly, um, and, I, and I, it's difficult because I, I don't think many of us realized um, until this started happening, you just gotta go, you know, I talked to as many Uber drivers as I can and were shocking to me that the unemployment benefits they were getting in LA were in general better, they were getting a thousand a week, basically equivalent to 52,000 a year. That, and for many people, that was better than what they could earn on the job. And it's, um, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a bigger story. It's a, it's a bigger issue about the income divide that's been going on in the country for a couple of decades. I think that though, that, that's, that's a topic that's not gonna go away. I think as long as uh, we let businesses open up again, and not all of them, have chosen to open up. Some of them are going out, are out of business because running a restaurant is a really tough business. And people, a lot of people I can see around me have just given up. Well, there will be other opportunities, but I think if we can get people back to their jobs, that goes a long way to alleviating that worry that you express. So I, you know, I think um, we, the economy's done a really good job so far, you know, to go from, we basically have recovered two thirds of the loss between March and April, which tells you there's something, you know, those, there, there's something going on. The economy has got enough dynamism that we're able, that it's got a lot of momentum in it. Though whether we can get back further, I think we're gonna need medical answers before we can expect to get back fully. But we need, you know, my own forecast call for unemployment down to 8% by the end of this year and then down to 4% by the end of next year. People think that's on the optimistic side of the Fed's views even. But um, I think because there was nothing wrong with the economy, there's no reason that we should not make every effort to try to get people back to work as quickly as possible because we were the ones that caused the problem. We asked people not to work. So we, we owe it to Americans to help get them back in their jobs. And I think the policy process is going to work in that direction. It, between what the Fed is doing, I mean, right now we're we're sort of we don't seem to be able to get together on the fifth initiative. But I think um, if if we don't get people, if, if we don't see continued steady progress on unemployment, I think we'll work harder to make it happen because it's in everyone's interest to make that happen. And you know, it's and it's interesting that that is a. That is something that we have a long history of. We, we know that the longer, the more you drag your feet getting people back to work, the more damage it does in the long run. And we've already got enough social tensions going on with, I mean, it, it's really innovation that's creating, that's driving this big divide. And we need to figure out how to help people who are not doing so well. And honestly, I think the best way is to get, get people trained better get them help try to figure out where are the jobs and work with the business community and the community colleges and help people understand where the opportunities are because there is, you can do pretty well. And, and the answer to this divide is to try to help people. There's a lot of jobs that are disappearing because of the innovation, um, the Amazon phenomenon. And, um, but there's a lot of opportunities too, but it takes a lot of work to get people there is the problem. Well, we appreciate that. I wanna open it up to um, other members of the board and the uh, county management team if they have any questions. We have about 10 minutes left, board members. Okay, anybody from the county? Oh, there's Vice Chair Fowler. Did you have a question, Vice Chair Fowler? Well, um... I don't know if it's, uh, I'm just wondering um, how you're, it looks like you're looking at this from the national point of view um, in the region. You know, I'm just wondering again, just to, um, in our region, we are not, I don't feel like we're recovering as fast and I'm not so optimistic as you are. 
and um, we are a tourism community. We have um, great challenges in um, just a lot of you know, great unemployment. We just lost um, uh, two huge um, employers, high paying jobs. Now we have these small businesses that are struggling to stay open because of the shutdowns. So you sound very, very optimistic and things are gonna be great. Uh, I'm just wondering how you apply that to our, our region and do you see yeah. that thing in our region and how have you, how have you looked at our region? You know, thank you, Sarah, for bringing Mr. Glassman in. Um, but, and it looks like you have a team and I'm just wondering that that's my thought. And then I'm concerned about our housing market, how that's going to be impact with this, with the, the mortgages, with the, um, with the rent, the rental, all the eviction that we, it may be coming through. And then we keep um, hearing the upscale in the fall time, this fall, it's going to um, the pandemic or the virus, there be more cases. And so um, it's just, I'm just not see. I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, what's it, you know, what's interesting. I mean, keep in mind, we're in the middle of major upheaval. And what's really interesting to me, um, I look, I have, I have some charts I, I pulled out for you uh, looking at the Tucson area. You could, you could drop into every community and you see the same story. Whether you go to Springfield, Illinois or Chicago, Illinois or Austin, Texas, no matter where you go, everybody was touched the same way. Um, it, you don't look any different than anybody else. And it's not surprising because what do we do? This, was a, this is a global crisis. And the only thing we knew how to do was to ask businesses to, to, show, to slow down shut down and ask people to stay at home. So it's, it's to me as you're right, I'm looking at this from an aggregate, from a national point of view, but really there is, I have not seen a community that looks any different from anybody else. And what, what I would say about Arizona, keep in mind, um, I know many states that would like to be in Arizona's position because you're, you're sort of situated I mean, it's nothing like the boom you had a decade ago, but Arizona is sitting in a in a good position from us from a from this perspective. I mean, your your challenge is to try to keep businesses centered there. But what you what you have going on in the country is that there's a couple of big trends going on. The country's getting older, so people are are moving from the north, you know, from the Midwest and the Northeast. To warmer climates in Phoenix, you get a lot of people from the Chicago area. You see a lot of Midwesterners coming out west. Secondly, we had a lot of young people who, in the last crisis, came out of school, didn't couldn't find jobs. So what did they do? They went back to school. Three million people had to suspend life decisions. People get married later today. They start families later, and so the whole real estate sector has been affected by that. And it's only now beginning to wake up. And then thirdly, a lot of, in this expansion, the West Coast and the Northeast kind of sprang back to life the quickest, but it's getting very expensive to live in those areas. And so what you're finding is people are migrating elsewhere. When I talk to our business clients that are in the real estate business, they say there's a real frenzy of activity going on in the mountain states, the Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. Because, why? Because it's gotten so expensive to live in the Bay Area and Seattle and, and Louisiana, I mean, and Los Angeles, that you're seeing this organic rebalancing going on. So I think, I think um, you sitting in a really wonderful part of the country. I wouldn't be surprised. And so you're, you're an important part. Tourism is an important part of that. But I really think that uh, of all the regions, I would think that Arizona would be positioned pretty well for the kind of trends that we see going on, let alone um, people are rethinking the idea of being in a dense urban area. 
you hear this story a lot in the New York area. People would people want to move where they get a little more space and they don't have to live on top of each other. So I have a feeling, at least when it comes to residential, that you'll see more of it. It's it's the kind of thing that's very slow moving. It's like watching grass grow. But um, honestly, I think you need right now. It's really hard to see the optimism because you're in the middle of you know, like we all are in the middle of a major upheaval. But you were on a really good track. Uh, Arizona, like the, this picture here is showing you uh, what was going on um, with employment trends. And Arizona was doing better than the national economy. And that's really part of this aging of the American population and young people moving inward where it's more affordable. Uh, your county slowed a little bit recently. I'm not sure what's exactly behind the most recent trends, but you were looking a lot like the national trend, uh, more Phoenix that was doing better. So I would say, hold the thought. I think, you know, we got to get through this crisis first. And you're right, it is putting tremendous stress on municipal budgets. Honestly, I'm hopeful that Washington knows that. And there's no reason why we shouldn't, since we were willing to go out of our way to protect furloughed workers. We ought to be willing to provide as much help as we can for people whose budgets are being affected by the quarantines. And right now, um, even though we're letting people go back to work, it's a lot more difficult to run a business to be normal when you gotta keep distance from everybody. So I'm hopeful, I think relative to you're right, it's, it's sitting here in the middle of this kind of chaos. But honestly, I, I, I think if I look at local communities, I think I'm more optimistic about your region than many regions. You know, Texas, you, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. I mean, um, I think I, even before this crisis, you were beginning to see an organic rebalancing as people were you know, if you don't have parents to help you, you can't afford living in these big urban areas. And so when you look at that, that's why, that's why what's going on in Denver is that's what's happening in Denver. And you see it everywhere, St. George, Provo, uh, Salt Lake City. So I, I, think, I, think there is, I think there are silver linings out there. If you can look far enough, that's the, that's, you gotta look past this chaos. Well, thank you so much. And unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Um, we do appreciate you spending an hour with us. And we, uh, I personally am looking forward to the uh, optimistic picture that you're painting. I think that would be you know, incredible for our region. And um, hopefully, uh, we can next year, uh, look back and say, wow, Mr. Glassman was right on that. And so, but we, we appreciate your insight and we really um, value your time. I wanted to uh, turn it over to Treasurer Benatar to see if she had any closing remarks. Treasurer Benatar. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Archuleta and board members. And, and thank you, Jim, for joining us. Um, you know, I, it's going to be an interesting year. So yeah, um, you know, we're just going to take it one day at a time and, um, you know, keep taking a look at, at the data, seeing what's happening. And it really is one day at a time. Things can change tomorrow in a ways that we couldn't even imagine. So today, so it, it really is a, a really unique situation. And I appreciate, um, Jim, you being here and, and sharing your insights um, and, and what you're seeing on a national level. So thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Um, the board is going to actually go into executive session. So we will be um, recessing our session here um, that we just started until 3.15. So our public session will be recessed until 3.15. And I'm going to um, ask the board to um, make a motion to go into executive session for discussion and consultation with our attorneys. Is there a motion to do so? 
I'll move. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second to go into executive session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, we are going to go into executive session. So we are going to close out of Zoom and then we are going to go to the Teams meeting that should be on your calendar. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon. The Board of Supervisors is resuming its regular session. Uh, we just completed an executive session and we on our agenda, if you are following, we are on item action item number 12. And I just want to confirm that there is a quorum of the Board of Supervisors here before we go on to our action item. I do see Supervisor Parks. Present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Let me just make sure that we have Supervisor Fowler. Madam Chair, we do not at this time. I see that. Okay, super. Thank you. I will go ahead and let her know that we're ready. The board did take a quick uh, water break. So let me just let her know that we are ready to get started. Supervisor Babbitt and Supervisor Ryan are not with us this afternoon. They have um, some other commitments that um, did not allow them to be at the board meeting at this time. Madam Chair, I did send her a note. Okay, great, thank you. Well, we'll just wait a minute here. Gives people a chance to stretch. She's joining now, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. Madam okay. Chair, I apologize for my tardiness. Thank you so much, Supervisor Feller. Well, I know we were taking a, a break and so I appreciate, appreciate you um, coming back, no problem at all. So we are um, now in regular session and uh, we have action item number 12. Is there a motion to approve a proposal of settlement via an offer of judgment in Neon Acquisitions versus et al. versus Coconino County, which is TX 2020 0008 with direction authorizing the county attorney to sign and serve the proposed draft offer of judgment on the county's behalf with the intent that the county be bound by any acceptance of this offer of judgment pursuant to rule 68 of the Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure. Mad Madam Chair, I will uh, make the motion to approve um, the item that you just uh, read and we did do uh, meet in executive session. And so uh, we are in agreement. Thank you. Okay, is there a second? I'll second the motion, Madam Chair. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion as stated, Please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. None opposed, passes unanimously. All right, thank you. That concludes um, our um, action item on number 12. We're now going to go to item number 14. And that is update, discussion, and possible action regarding the Coconino County response to COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this afternoon we have uh, Sarah Schildecker who is going to be uh, providing the overview. 
County Manager Jane, did you have anything prior to um, me handing it over to Sarah? No, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, Dr. Peoples is on with, uh, with Sarah and uh, is, is here to answer other questions. But Sarah, I just want to say thank you for, I've got some positive reports about some recent updates that you've done uh, with other forums and uh, just uh, appreciate all that you, Kim, Dr. Peoples and the HHS team are doing uh, in this time of the pandemic uh, and what you do every day to serve people in community. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, County Manager Jane, for the introduction. Um, this is my first time screen sharing on Zoom, so can you just confirm that you can see my PowerPoint? We can see it, thank you. Wonderful, and do you need me to start the video or do you just wanna look at the PowerPoint? You don't. Um, oh, if you have a video, that would be that would be great. We're, it's just we're my face. <laughs> So. Oh, video of your face? Well, sure, why not? We'd love to see your face. All right, I can see if both will do it simultaneously. Okay, there um, you go. wonderful. Thank you, um, Chair Archuleta and members of the board for having me here today. I'm excited to give this update. Um, I live and breathe COVID right now, so it's always wonderful to be able to share the current data and um, what we know about what's going on with COVID-19 in this day and age. So I want to start us out with just a quick situation update and then I'm going to go into talking about where we are at as a county in terms of our transmission level and then I'm going to review some differences among the two sets of guidance that ADHS has issued. One is for schools and one is for businesses and those are our overall benchmarks that we have become familiar with the minimal moderate and substantial categories of transmission and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. So current case counts, we are at 3,214 cases in Coconino County, 1,477 of which are in Flagstaff, 1,276 in tribal communities, 290 in Page, 67 in Williams, 45 in the Grand Canyon Village and Tucson area, and 59 in other areas. Um, to date, we have conducted, um, well, we have received 32,566 negative tests, leading to a 9% positivity overall throughout the pandemic. There are currently no pending tests reported to CCHHS. That's because we're in the middle of a surge event where testing is being done in California, and um, we don't have access to those pending results at this time. There have been 125 deaths associated with COVID-19, and that has resulted in a 4% case fatality or mortality rate. And um, what this tells us is that we can expect of the people who become infected with COVID-19, we can expect that 4% on average will pass um, as COVID-19 infection being a primary cause of death. There have been Excuse 580. Me, yes. Um, are there slides that are that you want to reference in regards to this data or this okay. is just verbal data at the time? Um, I don't have, it's just verbal right now. I do have okay. some slides. Can you see oh, the PowerPoint as well right now? Yes, I can see the title page. Okay. But I just wasn't sure if you were, if you had graphs or something that you're referring to. No, right not right now, but I will okay. walk you through some graphs. Um, and so total to date hospitalizations have been 587 and four currently hospitalized. And um, so about 18% of our cases have been hospitalized. So next, um, see if I can go through here. Uh, I have some graphs that are just um, excerpts from our most recent weekly report that was published last Friday and was sent to you at that time. Uh, just so you know, there's a five-day data lag for all of these reports, so you can see the most recent data, and it is ending um, the week of August 22nd, so the week prior to the week in which it was published, and the weeks run from Sunday to Saturday, just for your reference. And what this is, is it's an overlay of our cases and our case incidents. And what you can see, um, the green bars, those are the crude number of cases each week. And then the red line is the um, case incident. So you can see they pretty much mirror each other, but they are two different um, statistics that we use in public health to determine uh, transmission levels. And what this graph shows us is that since pretty much the middle of July, we've been on a steady decline. And um, it's a pretty consistent decline from week to week. So that's always good to see. And the next slide is our cases by geographic area. Um, so this is parsed out among Page, tribal communities, Williams, Grand Canyon, and other areas. Um, it should also 
have Flagstaff in here, so I apologize for that. But um, in this slide, what we see is that tribal communities have traditionally held the higher burden of COVID-19 transmission, but that over time that has gone down and is now mirroring um, transmission in other areas of the county, which is wonderful. So this is um, another excerpt from our weekly report. And this is where we have um, a little blurb about community transmission and that's located at the bottom of page two on the report. So every week we're reporting on our current metrics. Um, as of the last report, which was the week ending August 22nd, we had an incidence rate of 38 cases per 100,000 population, a percent positivity of 3%, and a COVID-like illness incidence, which you will also hear referred to as CLI. And this mirrors the um, influenza-like illness that is frequently reported by CDC, so that we've just adapted it to COVID. And that incidence is 4%. Um, given these metrics, I, I just wanna say we are currently at a moderate level of community transmission, but I'm gonna explain why we're at moderate. But first I wanna talk about um, the table beneath. So this is, pretty much a mirror image of the ADHS the benchmark guidance to businesses. The first row is called cases. It's a little misleading because what it really means is case incidents, but this is how they have it published. It just says cases. The second row is percent positivity and the third row is CLI. Uh, you'll then see the three different transmission levels. We have minimal, moderate, and substantial. These were originally derived from a CDC pandemic mitigation document that was published um, pretty much at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in spring. And ADHS has since put some metrics to those and quantified what these different transmission levels mean, which has been great for us in public health because we haven't been able to say up until now, are we in substantial, are we in moderate? Um, we know that we have community-wide transmission of the illness, but we didn't have a way to really put it into an appropriate category. So ADHS has released that guidance. We have been um, in the moderate phase. In order to move from one phase to another, we have to meet two consecutive weeks of the appropriate benchmark phase um, for each of these benchmarks, for all three. So while we are, have been in moderate, um, our case incidence is also currently in moderate. Although our percent positivity and our CLI are currently at a minimal phase, we can't move into minimal transmission until our case incidence also declines into minimal transmission. And once it does that for a two week period, we can then officially move as a phase into the minimal phase of transmission. So, my next slide, let's see if it, come on. Um, this is just an excerpt, it's the same table, um, but this is uh, cut and pasted from ADHS business benchmarks. Um, again, we see that the minimal is less than 10 cases per 100,000, um, percent positivity less than 5% and CLI less than 5%. That's where we want to get to and um, we are not there yet. The good news is that, as I showed you earlier, we have had a continued downward trajectory for case incidents um, over the past few weeks. So we are confident that if all things remain stable, that we will continue to see that decline and within the next few weeks, be able to move into the minimal transmission category. All right. And so these are the ADHS schools benchmarks. These are different. Um, this guidance came out actually prior to the business guidance where they quantified the different transmission phases. And this is a pass fail system. Um, you've probably seen the check marks and the X marks in some different documents. So if you get a green check mark, you passed. If you get a red X mark, you have not passed. And it's tended to be pretty straightforward so people can understand it. Passing from what we can see really roughly aligns with being in a moderate level of transmission. So I'm gonna go over the three metrics because they are the same benchmarks we're looking at, but they do have some slight differences to the guidance um, for businesses. So the first benchmark is cases. And the main difference here is that we can have either a two week decline in the crude number of cases, or we can have a two week case rate of less than 100,000 cases per 100,000 population within the county. 
percent positivity um, needs to be less than seven percent. So while seven percent falls within the range for moderate transmission of five to ten percent, um, you can be in a moderate level of transmission but still uh, be at seven percent or eight percent or nine percent. And if you're in that number, then you will not meet this benchmark for the school reopening to in-person instruction. And the third, again, is CLI, and that's um, two weeks with hospital visits due to CLI below 10%. 10% is the cutoff for entering moderate, so that aligns really nicely with moderate levels of transmission. What you see on the right side of the slide are, um, is just a screenshot from ADHS's schools dashboard. I don't know if you've visited it before, but this is what you would see if you were to enter that website, and it's um, drilled down to Coconino County. And, and again, you'll see that we have met the first benchmark because we've had a case incidence of less than 100 cases um, per 100,000 individuals. I do want to point out as we're looking at these um, graphics here that we're going to see slightly different numbers when we look at ADHS's display of our data rather than Coconino County's display of the data. And that's because we receive our data sooner. So those weak cutoffs are not going to align perfectly. Another reason is that ADHS is following a 12-day reporting lag and we are following a five-day reporting lag. So don't be confused when you look at these and see that they don't line up um, perfectly. Uh, we wish they could, but data doesn't work that way in our world. So um, we, we have to kind of look at our own data and also look at ADHSs when we're making these determinations. The second benchmark is not met according to ADHS. And you'll see that the percent positivity differs a fair amount from what we report in our um, weekly report. And the reason for that is that ADHS is only looking at electronically reported labs when they're doing these calculations. And TGen, as our primary lab, does not report electronically. So they are essentially excluding all of the TGen results that we are including in our data. So that's why the percent positivity is so different um, among our data and ADHS's data. And the third metric, you'll see the CLI, um, we get that data directly from ADHS. So that should always match up with what you see on the dashboard. Um, however, it is important to note again that there's a 12 day reporting lag for ADHS's data. So we're always going to be a week behind with CLI. Um, so I just want to quickly review the key differences between the two sets of guidance. Um, the guidance to businesses, let me go backwards. It's um, these descriptive metrics. So we have a qualitative descriptor of minimal, moderate, substantial, but we also have metrics um, with which to associate ourselves versus the um, ADHS system, which is a pass-fail. And the ADHS system for schools, um, the pass-fail system roughly aligns with that moderate level of transmission. The second key difference is that uh, for businesses, they have to use case incidence, but for schools, they can use case incidence or a two-week decline in the number of cases. And the third key difference is the percent positivity. Um, the moderate levels are five to 10%. But for the schools, it needs to be that's less than 7% in order to meet that benchmark. So that was my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Sarah. Chairwoman looks like she's working on her mute button. <laughs> County Manager Jane, in addition to uh, what Ms. Schildecker shared, and thank you, Sarah, you did a great job. Great job. Sharing the nuances of the data. It is not an easy thing to share and to convey, so thank you for doing that. In addition to what she shared, what you have in your email is a draft snapshot of the proposed new dashboard. We know that it will continue to be a uh, work in progress, but we. Uh, 
hope that it gets more in follow up to the conversation that we had at the last board meeting in needing to transform the data now that we have six months of it and make it more user friendly and intuitive for people to view. Uh, that is what the, the goal of sending that draft was and would really like to thank our public affairs team, uh, Eric Peterson and Alexandra Fisher for their, their work on that. They've done a really nice job putting it together. And we know that it will continue to be fluid as COVID continues to change and evolve and that we'll continue working on how we demonstrate the data. But hopefully this gets us closer uh, to where we would like to be. So if there weren't any questions for Sarah and I don't have additional Actually, items. Actually, I'm sorry, I do. Great. I've just been fighting with my screen. Every time I touch it, it disappears. So I, I apologize for that. Um, well, I just, I wanted to also just uh, thank Sarah and the entire team for all of the data. I know that you churn a lot of data um, out. You work on a lot of data and the Board of Supervisors um, does know that. And we recognize the quantity of work that goes into making all the graphs and providing what you provided on your screen. And we wanna thank you very much. Um, you know, we're really trying to determine like which data is you know, super helpful. And as we evolve through the COVID, I mean, data that we needed in March is, um, has now evolved to different data that we need now. And so I just want to, I wanted to let you know that, that we, we understand the, the quantity of work that goes into develop, developing all of the reports and the information you put out. So I think it, and perhaps um, Dr. Peebles will address this as well, but you know, yesterday the governor announced that there were nine counties that, um, that were businesses could move into uh, reopening at a certain capacity. And I think, um, you know, just for members of the public, um, you know, that's a bit of a green light, like, oh, you know, we we're part, of, we're kind of on this road to a green light to reopening and maybe some things getting back to normal. And, you know, and obviously you showed some information today that it's like, it looks extremely hopeful, but hey, let's don't jump the gun yet, right? So I think um, for, for me, it's just like how, you know, how do we communicate that out to the public? I mean, part of it is, I mean, it, um, it's not necessarily that it's nuanced, but it's, um, it's just that we, we have particular data that shows that we are heading in the right direction, but just not quite yet. And so I think just in terms of like, how do we, how do we best, um, if we were to kind of give like the elevator speech of where we're at right now, what would that be? So great. Sarah, certainly good. I was gonna say, I'd invite you to chime in because this is part of what your team has been working on. So please. Um, so I don't have an elevator speech prepared yet, but I, I do have a speech that I always give about public health primary prevention of disease. And what I would say is that as we're messaging this, we really emphasize that now more than ever is when we need to keep um, employing our primary prevention methods of wearing a mask, staying home when sick, washing hands, um, hand sanitizing, all of those things. We really believe that that has what has helped curb the spread of this illness and why we see that decline. So it's not, we're not at a point where we can say, yay, let's just go back to normal. This is a time when we really need to keep practicing those methods so that we can get there into that minimal phase and stay there. It really only takes, without herd immunity, which we don't have, or a vaccine, it really only takes a very, very small amount of illness to spread and in fact, a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Great. Well. Thank you. We appreciate that. And that's the, that's the constant question that we're getting, right? It's like, how much time do we have to be in that, you know, minimal phase to then say, okay, we can begin to do more activities that we nor we used to do prior to, to COVID, right? I mean, people are kind of looking for like, what's that magic number, that magic point. Supervisor Fowler, did you have a question? Yes. And thank you so much for all your work and um, helping us to understand data. <laughs> I remember early on uh, the data that was presented and we had to figure out, okay, what does that mean? So by, by now you have, you have pretty much educated us on how to look at data. So thank you, really appreciate that. So um, what would your advice be for the community, for individuals to um, how to prepare for this winter 
you know, the, the Arizona, I believe yesterday's um, health director said that we were going to have, um, we're going to be um, going into the winter months with the flu season and it's just going to escalate again. So what would be the advice and how do, how are we preparing for that? And what should we be telling the public or what are you telling the public? So that would be my question. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I get to talk about the thing I love to talk about the most, which is flu shots. Uh, my advice and our advice is that everyone who can receive a flu vaccine this season, receive a flu vaccine this season. Typically, we only see about a quarter of the population elect to get a flu vaccine for various reasons. Um, but what we know, I think CDC released a report yesterday or the day before that showed that um, rough estimates of 94% of people who've died from COVID had an underlying health condition. Um, other comorbidities were um, influenza infection. So uh, it's really important to get a flu shot to one, decrease the burden on the, the hospital system, but also for your own individual health because when you have multiple viral infections at one time, it beats your immune system down more than if you just had one and it makes it harder to overcome and more likely that you're going to have secondary complications that um, could even result in death. And then the third reason we always tell people to get a flu shot is because it helps protect others. We do not have a vaccine for COVID-19 right now. Um, immunization is just one of the most effective ways and greatest public health interventions of all time um, to prevent the spread of a disease because it's relatively cost effective and it's incredibly efficacious. Uh, without a vaccine, we really have to rely on those other methods like staying home and sick, uh, monitoring yourself for illness, making sure that you're disinfecting frequently, washing your hands, hand sanitizing, wearing a mask, all these things that we have been telling the public to do and practicing ourselves, we're going to need to continue to do until we have a vaccine for COVID-19 um, or have established a level of herd immunity, which would be about like 60 to 80% of the population would have to be infected with COVID-19 in order to get to that point. Um, so the most important thing you can do is to keep practicing um, those methods of disease prevention and to get a flu shot. Okay. We, we, we provide uh, flu shots. Uh, and, and are we going to be um, holding or hosting flu shots around the county like we have done with the testing? Yes, thank you for that question as well. We are. Um, we're going to follow a similar model to what we did for specimen collection, which involves um, the geographic areas and different parts of the county that we we tend to visit anyway, but we're going to make sure we go multiple times this year um, to places like Williams, Tucson, Fredonia, Page, um, the Happy Jack region, make sure we hit all those different corners of the county. And we are also going to target um, vulnerable populations and high risk populations such as people living in congregate um, facilities or um, shelters, uh, first responders, um, those healthcare workers, people who are going to be at a higher risk of either acquiring um, influenza or um, being affected by it due to underlying health conditions. How long after you get a flu shot, how long does it um, protect you? It, Estimates vary. It's going to protect you for the season. So each flu vaccine, it's really neat. The reason that we get a new one each year is because each one is unique and it's designed to combat the, um, the strains that we expect to be circulating this season. And we get that data, well, we don't, but CDC and WHO get that data from Southern Hemisphere. So when we're in our flu season, the Southern Hemisphere is not. And when we are not, they are. So it, it kind of circulates like this. And we can look at that data to predict what, which strains will be circulating. Um, that happens in February every year. So the vaccine that we have now um, was chosen in February and has been manufactured over the past few months. And it's designed to provide protection throughout the flu season, which will um, really never fully ends, but officially ends in about April and May of each year. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn it over to Dr. Peoples. Thank you, Sarah. 
Thank you so much. Sarah, yeah, great job. Uh, so I don't have further updates, but uh, Ms. Kim Musselman has a few updates that she wanted to share as well. So Kim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Come on. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Fowler or Chair Archuleta, and uh, thank you to all the board. I just had a couple of other things to add. I know we're short on time. Um, I just wanted to update the board regarding our ACS tier one site. We have executed our 30 day notice with the owner of the site and staff are preparing for the transition. Um, obviously we're looking at what that is going to do and not certainly not stepping out of that space, but uh, of providing shelter for those who are positive or awaiting testing, but looking at a different model around that. Uh, to date we've had 410 guests and currently we have 10. Also wanted to just briefly give an overview of where we are with the saliva testing. Um, there's a press release going out and NAU is actually uh, starting their saliva testing tomorrow. The press release includes information about their testing time, location, and dates. And we will be, we continue to have the uh, self-administered nasal, nasal swabs available at Fort Tuthill through the rest of uh, this week through Friday from noon to 8 p.m. And then we will not have testing at Fort Tuthill on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And we'll be resuming testing at Fort Tuthill with the saliva-based model and also still have nasal pharyngeal swabbing available for uh, those who are under five years of age beginning on Tuesday, September 8th. And the hours are going to be 10 to three, Monday through Friday. And we're gonna be providing Saturday testing from eight to noon. Uh, so just wanted to give that brief overview. Also to let the board know, and I'll be providing additional detail related to this, but we continue uh, to work with our environmental health uh, team in terms of our executive order enforcement um, I just wanted to provide a, a brief update regarding that, that we have had lots of uh, questions and conflicting information, um, but at this point in time, wanna make sure the board's aware that environmental health isn't able to enforce the executive orders following the civil legal tract as originally planned. Instead, due to the statutes referenced in the executive order 2020-47, uh, Environmental health is following a criminal legal process and only if absolutely needed, uh, which means that obviously first and foremost, we are providing education and recommendations, verbal warnings to correct the violations uh, that may be exhibiting and our environmental health inspectors, it will work directly if there continues to be violations with law enforcement and in conjunction with law enforcement regarding possible uh, misdemeanor citations if necessary. Um, we also ha have reached out, just as you're aware, the board approved the IGA this morning with ADHS for um, some funding related to complaint referrals. And in the scope of work of the contract, there were a couple of areas that we are seeking some clarification before we actually uh, accept any of that funding. And because there's some confusion about uh, the language about HHS being health and human services being able to enforce all executive orders, which um, we do not believe that we have the legal authority to do that. So we are awaiting some additional information and um, going to be working with the state so that we fully understand what kind of uh, response we're going to have to some of those other businesses that do not fall necessarily under uh, environmental health authority, specifically places such as indoor movie theaters, gyms, and some of the bars, et cetera, that aren't licensed businesses in Coconino County. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if there's additional information or inquiry you have at this time. Otherwise, I will provide some additional detail uh, to you all via email as, as we get other answers. All right, thank you so much. Is there, are there any questions for our interim um, HHS director regarding um, what she reported on or other items? Okay, 
Great. Well, thank you for the update. Oh, wait, hang on. Vice Chair Fowler has something for you. Vice Chair Fowler? Yes, thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you to you and your team for working um, to um, on this on a daily basis. And um, also, also all our community partners. I know that the, we, we work continuously with the, our towns and cities and other hospitals and, and even nonprofits and volunteers. So I just want to thank you for that. And, you know, with our numbers going down, um, how um, does that mean when we, you know, even I think the testing, the number of people that are being tested is going down as well. Now, does that mean that most of the people that need this test have already gotten it? Or are we not getting the word out where people really do need to get tested? I think sometimes too, um, people are afraid to be tested to see if they um, to they don't want to know, or maybe they're afraid to find out, or I'm not exactly sure what it is um, that people are not getting um, the test that they need. So um, I know early on there was a huge demand for testing. And now, uh, now that we seems like we're having it, we're not getting the people that we thought that we, we I thought anyway, that we would be um, getting the numbers would be, I thought it'd be much higher. So thank you, Vice Chair Fowler for that question. Um, that's kind of the million dollar question right now, because I absolutely, we have testing available. We're actually bringing other kinds of testing. So it's less intrusive. Um, you know, we're going to be rolling out the saliva base. So now you'll be doing everything yourself and just spitting into a little tube uh, to gather your saliva. So I think that, you know, there's a, a few answers to that. I don't know which one is truly the most accurate, but I think to some extent, I think we have gotten, you know, to use a, a, a coined term, COVID fatigue, if you will. I think people are at a point of, you know, we're six months plus into this and um, not necessarily embracing uh, the fact that we have to stay vigilant. I think the, the best, my best response to that is we just have to continue to encourage people and, and also communicating with them that that's part of our, our plans to be able to phasally reopen. Part of that early on from the CDC recommendations that Sarah mentioned early in her report specifically said that a robust testing plan would, would be in place. And so we have that now finally. And so we have to continue to make sure we're encouraging people to do that. I, I would add one of the things that we're gonna be doing as well and, and would look to each of you board members in terms of helping get this word out. In addition to providing the saliva testing at Fort Tuthill and here in Flagstaff, we're also gonna be doing remote testing sites with the saliva-based testing. So the first one is gonna be September 10th in Tucson, then we've got them scheduled uh, and getting everything formalized to, to Blue Ridge, to Page, to Munns Park, um, Fire, to Williams, and many of the even other smaller unincorporated areas. So we're really trying to make a rotation and spread that out and also take those other kinds of testing out into some of those other areas around the county. Thank you, and, I, and uh, Madam Chair, if I could continue. Um, I know we meet. Go ahead, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I know we meet with our public schools, and well, not just the public schools, but schools within our county. Um, and there's national discussion about whether every student should be tested and their family um, prior to having them reopen the schools. Are we? Um, is is there a plan in Arizona to do so, or where are we with that? Thank you, Vice Chair Fowler and uh, Chair Archuleta. I, I am not aware of a plan yet for the state of Arizona. I know that there's been lots of discussion about that. Um, certainly in our, in Coconino County, we intend to um, push to all of the schools that they recommend and get participation from the school age folks to participate in the testing. Um, we, we don't have a specific plan in place yet, and I'm not aware of that yet for the state. Uh, as Of course, that could be in the works as we speak. Uh, I'm just not familiar with what that is at this point in time, but we certainly want to continue to encourage all of our schools, our families, 
uh, administrators, employees, teachers, all of those folks to utilize the testing services that are available. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for this report. And um, my job is to keep us on task and on time here. So we're gonna move to item number 15. This is a discussion update and possible direction to staff regarding state and or federal legislative or administrative matters. And we have Public Affairs Director Eric Peterson who will present this item, Eric. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Eric Peterson. Uh, glad to be here. I'll be very brief today. Um, I was going to present last week on CSA and ACO items. We are scheduled uh, to give you a roundtable presentation and to go over legislative items for the CSA Legislative Summit on October 6th. We will be providing the binders for the CSA Summit about a week ahead of that time. Uh, so you'll have some time to review them and look at the talking points we've created. Obviously, uh, the summit is not until later in October. Uh, it starts on the 21st uh, and we will take uh, feedback as we have in the past years, make revisions and provide you new inserts and such to the, uh, to the meeting notice and the meeting minute, uh, the talking points. Um, part of that is though, uh, CSA did discuss the legislative summit this week. I do not uh, have an update yet from uh, Executive Director Craig Sullivan on what is the outcome and what will the summit uh, be? Will it be virtual? Will, will it be uh, another, another process? Uh, we just simply have not been told. So I don't have an update for you at this time on uh, what the format of the summit will be. Uh, do expect that soon though from CSA so people can make appropriate plans. I do know that they were pretty much an even split between the um, between uh, your fellow colleagues about whether or not to meet in person or to meet uh, socially, uh, virtually, excuse me, over Zoom and such. So uh, they have discussed that, we'll get an answer for you. Uh, and then the final thing I just wanted to briefly bring up, it's a little more on communications, but I think you can see in my screen behind me is a picture of the Peaks uh, branded logo uh, on that. And you've probably seen a couple of these on meetings. We've been sort of testing them and making sure we've got our, our guidelines, helpful instructions for how to be in a virtual meeting and make a virtual presentation uh, set and ready. And you should be getting a copy tonight with instructions then how to add these virtual backgrounds to your computer uh, so that you can be uh, have this kind of logo and background. We have not just the image of the peaks, but many images from around the county that you can use and pull up uh, for uh, your use on meetings. Uh, and that is uh, my general report. I just want to do want to say thank you to the chairwoman. I had an excellent conversation yesterday with Congressman O'Halloran, the Blue Dog Coalition, uh, Matt Chase from NACO and others about the important needs of rural uh, America, rural Arizona, as we go through the COVID-19 pandemic and the future ahead and what this is showing about infrastructure and economic development looking forward. So I, uh, it was a great advocacy uh, time for us to talk about the need of counties uh, in front of folks. And it does, uh, it does go out to the national press. So we will be watching uh, to see what Hill Press and national folks pick that up. So thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Eric. And Really appreciate the backgrounds. That'll be uh, great, especially when we're in not only internal but external meetings as well. So that's that's wonderful. Any questions for Eric at this time? Okay, great. And my thanks to you and your team as well for uh, being um, on the uh, the uh, video presentation with me uh, to talk about what challenges rural counties face and specifically Coconino County um, has faced and is facing uh, responding to uh, COVID-19. It was a great opportunity for us to get our message out about what counties are doing on a daily basis to address the pandemic and then also just what the economic and um, you know, social and community situation is here as a result of the pandemic. So thank you for that. You're very County Manager Jane. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick reminder uh, that our next board meeting is Tuesday, September 8th. So a week from today, uh, it is our, our monthly evening meeting. Uh, but uh, as Lindsay just uh, sent you a, uh, an invite, uh, our meeting uh, is scheduled to start at 4.15, uh, where we will be having uh, an, a further property uh, discussion and executive session again next Tuesday, the 8th, uh, starting at 4.15. Uh, Madam Chair, we do tentatively have a joint meeting with the City of Flagstaff, which is a quarterly meeting. As you remember, our last one got canceled back from March, 
so that is tentatively scheduled for Monday, September 21st at four o'clock. Uh, I'll be talking with the city manager uh, in the next two days uh, and with, with you and others, uh, but I know Lindsay has talked to the city clerk about that. Again, tentatively scheduled for, Tuesday, for Monday, September 21st at four o'clock at joint meeting with the city of Flagstaff Council. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to just say again, thank you to, uh, to Eric Peterson and to Alex and the JIC team uh, for the new dashboard along with Marie and Kim uh, and the HHS team. Uh, I think it's uh, a great uh, step forward. Again, as Dr. Peoples mentioned earlier, uh, it is a, uh, a work in progress, uh, but that will be continued to be revised and just look for forward feedback on that uh, as we move forward. And again, just wanna say thank you and shout out to Sarah Schildecker. Uh, for her uh, great uh, report today, along with the the, uh, uh, the input from Dr. Peoples and Interim Director Musselman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any questions for County Manager Jane? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so now our last item is round table. And so let me just ask um, Supervisor uh, Parks and Vice Chair Fowler if you would, if there's anything you would like to share. Supervisor Parks. Uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I have a couple of things. Yes, um, <clears throat> I've been in discussions recently with uh, Jerry Sims of uh, Turf Paradise and um, he was, is considering asking us to uh, put on a race meet for next summer. He wants to have an invitational meet and he, he wants to call it uh, the Flagstaff Invitational. He has uh, plans to, to um, put, put uh, $2 million into the purses so that it will attract the better horses, the uh, Belmont Stakes, Kentucky Derby's uh, quality of horses to the meet. And um, he wants to do it as a, a as a uh, no cost to Coconino County um, race meet. Uh, he would also like to try to get uh, the, um, the county to, to uh, give him a, a five year contract with a an, um, an updated contract after that. Um, I, <clears throat> uh, David Johnson should have sent you all the, uh, the kind of the cursory proposal for what they have planned. And we're going to try to get it on the, uh, the agenda for the September 22nd meeting to, for discussion with all the board. Um, if you've looked over that, um, that proposal, it's pretty short. It's just a one pager. Um, they have, uh, they have proposed to, to do the work on the track, repair the track in the place where it's been really badly, uh, disturbed down to the base and, um, rebuild the entire surface of the track to the tune of about 800 thousand to a million dollars in order to put on this this meet it's in pretty bad shape right now but that in the infrastructure for the for the race meet would uh, be totally paid for by turf paradise in order to uh, to run their meet and uh, their OTB program oh, that's off track betting um, anyway that's a heads up on that that it may be coming up on September 22nd for discussion by the board. And um, they would like to get that before the board and get a decision from the board uh, within 30 days after that, because it's gonna take them quite a while to start working on the track and get it up to the kind of condition that it needs to be and actually hold a race meet after all these years. So um, that's the first thing I had. The, uh, the other thing I had is I've had quite a bit of conversation with the fire chief in Forest Lakes and with some of the residents down there. They are um, 
not in, we have three uh, national forests in our county, Kaibab, Coconino, and um, the uh, Black, Main, uh, Black Mesa district of the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest, which is unique to Forest Lakes area. Um, the Apache Sitgreaves has gone to stage two fire restrictions where, where, where we are still in stage one. And um, quite a few of the people down there are interested in, in uh, going on to the stage two fire restrictions in accordance with their particular um, forest over there, the Apache Sitgreaves forest. So that's kind of impossible for right now because our ordinance does not really allow for um, different. Hold on, sweetheart. I'm sorry. Keep going, Supervisor. Yep. Go ahead, Supervisor Parks. It was just a mute issue. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, anyway, um, uh, I've talked to, to County Manager Jane and, and, um, and to you also, and we've discussed uh, maybe we could have a uh, a revisitation of that ordinance in order to to recreate the zones that we had at one time. Supervisor Ryan told me that at one time we had the ability to um, remove or or have different different areas of the county go into different fire restriction um, uh, qualifications. He said that at, when he was um, in, in uh, charge of when his district included Forest Lakes and Blue Ridge, that it, at one time they did have different fire restriction codes for uh, those areas that receive a little more moisture and also for places like um, Sedona and Ash Fork that, that receive less moisture. And um, I, as I discussed with you yesterday, you know, we are the second biggest county in the United States, and there's no reason that we have a one size fits all um, fire restriction code. So maybe we could revisit that code and, and do some changes to it after, after this, uh, this fire season's over. I mean, we wouldn't be able to get to it right away. It, it would not include this fire season at all, but maybe we could make some improvements to that code. And that's uh, all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Appreciate that update. And um, I think just the only thing would be that the Parks and Rec Commission, um, it would be good to for them to look over the, um, the proposal as well um, from the party that was uh, that is proposing um, a racing event, I think that would be helpful as well. Okay, I will make sure that they that the commission gets that. It was sent to to uh, Cynthia. Uh -huh. so, um, oh, good. Yeah, he has it at least. So I'll I'll make sure that the commission gets it. Okay, sure. She can she can run through the process with that as well too. So great. Thank you so much for the update. Thank Supervisor you. Feller. Here we go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I like to um, just encourage everyone to uh, self-respond on the census. Uh, we only have one month to go. The end of September is when it's going to end. We have tried, to, we sent a letter in um, and many local governments, even the National Counties Association has submitted um, requests for an extension to back to uh, move it back to uh, end of October. Uh, and it's up to Congress to approve that, and we have not received it yet. So we have one month left to go. So in Coconino County, we, um, you know, the state of Arizona, we have 61 
little over 61% that is has respond. Um, and our county sits about 43 or so. Um, City of Page is about 39. Uh, and so we have got to really um, ask all our employees, like to have all our employees um, to self-respond. And all of the businesses, I've talked to uh, Chris who meets with businesses. I've asked Supervisor Ryan when he's in a meeting with the towns and cities to please announce um, all, every organization, nonprofits, everyone need to ask their employees, to ask their families to um, self-respond. We do not have enough um, census workers to go to every home and make sure that everyone has um, respond. Uh, in On Navajo Nation, I know that President Nez has done a proclamation asking um, everyone to self-respond to really um, make sure that there is a huge campaign that is done. Um, and it is so important. It's going to cost millions of dollars. Today is the day that the homeless population will be um, starting to count on that. So I just want to encourage everyone to do so and, and please help us to get that word out. It is so important to all of our budgets. Um, the other is that, I, mean, I want to go back again to census. You know, if we talk about health care, we talk about this pandemic, we talk about the roads and, um, you know, businesses wanting to get help um, and, you know, the um, child care, the um, food program. We just did a proclamation on the, um, on hunger uh, and all of that is census. And so any, but any time we write a grant, a nonprofit, anybody writing a grant that is based on census. Uh, and so from that, the redistricting is going to start taking place. The redistricting is based on the population. So I believe, and this is the way it is, is that elections and the um, and the census go hand in hand. Who you let into office is going to be the people that are going to be making decisions on the redistricting. Now the state of Arizona is, has just end their application process, I believe for the independent re redistricting commission. It is so important for us to all be involved in this process right now. So register to vote. Um, the, the deadline is October 5th, and we have got to make sure that we are um, involved in this process. We can't just make statements and then not carry through with our own action in being involved in the government. So um, we had a the the NACO RAC, which is the Rural Caucus met, and we talked about this it was one of the subjects. They are supportive of, um, they are lobbying to see if we can get an extension. The, I sit on the National County um, Census Working Group, and we, we decided that we're going to have a uh, town hall, and once that's, um, that is announced, we'll make sure we share that because um, the census counts are low uh, across the country, especially in the rural communities, which is very troublesome. Um, so that's, I just want to really um, emphasize that. And just, I know that it's on all of us. Um, I'm sure we're all talking about it. We just need to make sure that people do follow through and do take care of these so registration, register to vote, make sure you vote. Um, we wanna thank our county um, elections to for 
you know, work, always working with the community and setting up these polling sites. And then the, the concern about the post office, great discussions about the post office not being able to deliver. Please make sure once you receive your early ballot to vote early. And if you don't have, if you didn't, did not mail your ballot back in, then keep it and drop it off the day of the elections at the election site near you. So it is so important that we get involved in this. So I just want to um, bring those two um, to uh, bring it up again and we'll continue to do so. We just have one month to do that. So thank you so much. Yes, such a great message. Um, that is so absolutely so critical to the resources that counties and cities, the state get as well as our representation in Congress. Um, that is all determined by the number of people that are counted. And so thank you for that important reminder. And I know we've been doing a, a big push. Coconino County has been working so hard with our coordinated um, count committee. And we have so many partners in that from, um, you know, university, the cities within the county, uh, nonprofits, um, our tribal um, partners. I mean, everyone has been all hands on deck and just it's just been really challenging, as you mentioned, during this COVID time to do what we planned to do, which was be at every community event and be on the ground and providing computers and places for people to, to fill out their census. But you're right, it's coming down to the wire with this last 30 days and it's an important reminder. And we wanna thank you, Supervisor Fowler, for your service on the, um, with NACO, um, you know, on being one of the members of this, you know, national uh, task force um, who was really trying to, you know, push the, the census uh, forward and remind people of its importance. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to get back, I just, I remembered that, um, Deputy County Manager Lucinda Andriani, um, who of course supports uh, Parks and Recreation Director uh, Cynthia Nemeth, um, is with us. And you know, I I know that Supervisor Parks was talking about two things, and also um, you know, emergency management is in your area as well as the Parks and Rec. And so I just wanted to give you a chance. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't call on you earlier, um, Lucinda, in terms of just a path forward on how to bring these, these items up and um, to, to work on, you know, just the, both the fire restrictions as well as if there is a, a proposal that an entity wants to bring forward. Would you like to weigh in on that? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Archuleta. Um, with regard to the fire restrictions, uh, Wes is developing some alternative language so we can make those that modification to uh, to the fire restrictions uh, ordinance. And um, I mean, it, it's been interesting. His, I know in the last two years, we have actually implemented restrictions by area. There have been at least one or two occasions where we've had restrictions only applied, for example, on the Arizona Strip that typically tends to be the earliest area in some cases that, that gets restrictions. Um, but that's been on the front end of the process, not, not at the end of the season. So, or toward the end of the season, we hope the end of the season. Um, and so, you know, we can make those changes, uh, you know, accordingly. So we will do that, bring that back over to the, to the board this fall. Uh, and then relative to the, the new racing proposal, um, Director Nemeth has received that copy of that as was shared. And I will speak with her about sharing that with the commission um, and getting their input on that. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Supervisor Parks. And thank you, Director Andriani for um, for bringing forth those updates. Really appreciate that, Supervisor Parks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, Lucinda, I, <clears throat> I can, uh, I didn't mean to leave you out of the loop on that, um, uh, on that proposal, but I can uh, forward it over to you because I did receive it too. 
and um, I can make I, sure you have it. I have a copy. Uh, Cynthia oh. shared hers with me, and um, we've also shared that with Jimmy. So we're good. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Lucinda. Super, that's great. And, and uh, yeah, great news about the zones and you're absolutely right at one point um, in, in the county, we did have um, that fire restrictions by zones, knowing just how geographically diverse and vast the county is. Um, that's, a, that's a very good point and I look forward to seeing that um, this fall. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, I believe I'll, let's see, two things to report out. Um, I did attend the launch meeting um, yesterday. And of course, you know, launch is um, the, this community effort to bring forth a world-class education um, and launch is um, continuing to do their work. Um, right now they're looking at the topic of um, equity and education and um, have they're be working on a statement regarding um, just um, how our how looking at schools and looking at um, policies, curriculum, et cetera, to ensure that um, our education is equitable. And they'll be bringing forth um, that's that value statement to all the various entities um, that make up launch. Um, yesterday, um, Congressman O'Halloran asked me to participate in a roundtable discussion um, with uh, the, the members of Congress that make up the Blue Dog Coalition. And the subject was um, rural communities um, and COVID-19, what rural communities, the challenges and, and they are facing and the needs of rural communities. And so I was able to, um, I was joined on that panel by the uh, governor of the Acoma uh, tribe in New Mexico, um, as well as the um, Hopi tribal chairman. And um, I was, and then of course, uh, uh, Representative O'Halloran, he moderated the panel. Um, there were other um, members of Congress who were part of the Blue Dog Coalition. Um, Representative uh, Torres, Congressional Representative um, Torres from New Mexico, um, who represents the, one of the congressional districts there was on the line. And um, basically I was able to speak to the fact that rural um, community, rural counties, oh, Matt Chase from NACO was on there, was the other presenter, um, was able just to give a really vivid picture of what rural counties are facing in terms of this pandemic was able to communicate that it's counties that are really bearing the brunt of addressing the pandemic and um, wanted to and advocated for Congress to um, put forth another uh, CARES Act and to not only um, provide flexible funding, but of course, direct funding to counties um, funding that does not have to go through the state, but rather is provided directly to the counties. I spoke to the um, economic impact um, that COVID-19 um, has had and is continuing to have on Coconino County. Um, I talked about some of the things that we've done that have just been outstanding. Of course, our testing, um, the uh, standing up of the, the hotel for our um, populations of our community that are housing insecure, as well as housing of first responders, um, medical providers, et cetera, who have been diagnosed um, as positive with COVID so that they can um, be quarantined. And then also spoke about our, um, just our partnerships with, especially with our social services safety net coalition, how we've had food banks, um, you know, our housing nonprofits, um, you know, uh, medical providers, um, other foundations, um, you know, our own emergency services and health and human services, how we've all come together as nonprofits and really addressed community needs. And then of course advocated for um, more funding for that because as we know, we have, um, 
so many people who really require assistance and we've not been able to to meet all of that need so it was a it was the first round table that they've had so far on COVID-19 they will be having these round tables periodically and um, was just honored to be asked to do that in representing Coconino County. Um, so I th think that is it for now. Um, oh, Head Start is accepting applications. Um, so if you would like to get that information out, um, the Head Start, um, which is so important to our pre-K uh, children in our communities, um, NACOG Head Start is accepting applications for Head Start. Really encourage um, all of us to get that information out so that our community members can take advantage of that. Um, and that was announced at the, at the NACOG meeting. All right, well, I think that is it for now. Is there anybody else that has something that they would like to communicate? Seeing none, then that that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. And um, the next meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be next week on September 8th. Thank you so much.